Okay, so we're going to gavel in and get going. First off, I'm going to say that, um, so I'm the vice president. Normally, John Brown would be here in the president's role, but he is not here in the room tonight. He's joining virtually, so we thought it would be better for me to lead the meeting so uh, I could, uh, we, we anticipated that we would have a large crowd tonight and just thought it would be a little easier logistically for somebody here personally to be able to lead the meeting. So that is that, and I will open this up for the facility and safety awareness uh, meeting and logistics briefing. So thank you again for attending tonight. Really happy to have you know a group that's engaged and wants to come out and, and give us feedback. Human management and subject matter experts are here uh, with us in the room and virtually during tonight's presentations. Remote presenters will appear on the screen. Please make sure to speak loudly and clearly so everyone can hear you. Guests are invited to sign up at the table at the back of the room if they wish to provide public testimony. Visitor access is limited to the board meeting room and the restrooms. The restrooms are located through this door over here. In case of an emergency, such as a fire alarm, exit through the glass door at the back of the room. Here this lovely gentleman is entering, um, unless it is not safe to do so. The alternate emergency exit is located at the rear of the building. So that must be here. All right, during an evacuation, follow staff's instructions and stay together for safety. Tonight's meeting will be recorded. The recording will start when the meeting is called to order, so I've called the meeting to order, and will continue until adjournment. The meeting room will be muted during the break, and aside from that period, virtual participants on the screen and in the public audience will be able to hear conversations in the room. Okay, that is the meeting logistics briefing. Next up, we will have an agenda check. Any items to add or change? I recognize that it's a long agenda tonight, so if we see that there are some items or we're, we're getting too late in the evening, we do have a few that we may choose to move to an, move to the next meeting. So. And Frank, which which items did we talk about previously? Were those? We could move um, item 13 potentially, which is the 2023 organizational goals. Okay. So if it seems like we're running long, given how much public testimony we have and other discussions, um, we can all pull the board and then we'll have a conversation about whether we want to move that or if we want to keep plugging along. Next up on the agenda is items from board members and the general manager. And I will start with Commissioner Foster. Okay. Uh, just report that I met with John DeWinter, who's a board member on the Springfield Utility Board. Just uh, first time getting to meet him in my liaison so role. So nothing substantive. I've also been uh, invited to provide a gift to the city later in December uh, as part of the, um, the City Club's effort. You probably all heard of that. Anyway, it will be UM related because it's very public, but you know. Okay, Rowski, and then we'll go to John Brown. Hold on. Nothing. Okay, John Brown, anything? Nothing from me, thank you. Okay. Right, and um, I just wanted to thank the crew for an excellent eWeb run to stay warm. It was a fantastic event, beautiful day, and thank you for continuing to put that together to make sure that we can uh, give give to the folks who need it most. So thank you. All right, and then I'll turn it over to Frank. Yes, uh, Vice President um, Carlson, thank you. Just a couple of things I did want to mention the volunteers for the run to stay warm. We did have about 1,200 participants, uh, which was great news, and we will include all of the facts and figures and outcomes in our year-end operational report um, relative to how much that can, will contribute to our, uh, to our limited income programs. And then secondly, I did want the board to know that um, you know, we've been asked a number of questions about the grid attack that occurred uh, in North Carolina um, at the uh, Duke Energy substations um, that we will put some information together to, for the board in particular around what are uh, precautions and plans and uh, preventative measures as well as our responses are for um, 
potential issues like that, which we uh, take very seriously. So um, expect to hear more either during our check ins or during um, a general manager's report that you hear on that. So thank you. All right, next up we have public input. So I'm going to uh, go to the folks on the phone first to make sure that that's that runs smoothly. Uh, and then I'll go through. I have currently five that have signed up to testify in the room. So eight total. So we have oh, okay, six in the room. Perfect. Okay. When your name is called, please come forward and clearly state your name and optionally your address or ward. Each speaker will be offered three minutes to present their testimony. Please keep track of time and by watching the timer at the front of the room, uh, and that will also show on the screen for those who are uh, participating by phone. If you are participating, oh, here it is. If you are participating by telephone, remember to unmute your call. Press star six if calling from a landline, or simply use the unmute button if calling from your cell phone. After all testimony is heard, each commissioner will have an opportunity to speak if they choose. Although by policy, we do not engage in a back and forth dialogue. Please note that failure of a commissioner to speak shall not be construed as support of or opposition to any speaker's testimony. If a question is presented by a speaker and the board does not provide an answer, an EWEB staff member, member will contact the speaker so the question can be addressed at a later time. Commissioner Carlson, yes, I, I don't believe that phone ins will be able, unless they've got super duper eyesight, be able to oh, see the three minutes. So you may want to give them a 30 second warning. OK, I'll watch the clock there and I'll give you a little, little nod there when it's 30 seconds up. Thank you. It's been a bit <laughs> since I had to run through this process, so. We did hear you. We oh, no, thank you for letting me know. I'll try to speak up. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that being said, uh, we will turn it over to the uh, the speakers on the telephone. And I had first up Dylan Plummer. Is Dylan Plummer on yet? No. Okay, so we'll go to the next one, which is Bryce Cumston and then William Smith. And then I'll go through the, after I go through those two, I'll list off those that are testifying, <coughs> testifying in public in, in person here. And then I'll loop back to Dylan Plummer if he happens to join. So Bryce, are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Okay, your time starts now. Hi. Okay, uh, my name is Bryce Cumston. I live in Ward 3 and I support the dam removal. That's all. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next up, uh, William Smith. Hi, William Smith, Ward 1, here to talk about fiber optics. Last month, I offered public input on possible benefits of connecting meter technology to fiber optics. And this time I'd like to explore further what fiber optics could mean for EWAB and all of Eugene. And I'd like to do that by uh, talking about two cities in particular that are pretty far along with this. One is Chattanooga, Tennessee, population 180,000. So very close in size to Eugene, and they have a publicly owned utility called the Electric Power Board. And in 2010, they launched a fiber optic broadband network community-wide. And 10 years later, they commissioned a study, an independent study, which documented $2.69 billion return on investment and if you'd like to see a breakdown of the widespread economic benefits and social benefits uh, in my written testimony earlier today for all of you, there's a link. Or you can just do a search, uh, 2.69 billion Chattanooga. And then closer to home, we have Hillsboro, Oregon, which is the fifth largest city in Oregon, population 108,000. And they have launched their fiber optic broadband network called Highlight 
one word, H-I-L-I-G-H-T. You can search that or in the written testimony, uh, there's a link to their website explaining uh, why they're doing it, their plan, and how far along they are on it, milestones, et cetera, and why they believe this is an essential service for all residents and businesses, essential. And then there are, in addition to those two examples, there are hundreds of others listed in a book, an amazing book written by Harvard law professor Susan Crawford called Fiber, The Coming Tech Revolution and Why America Might Miss It. I highly recommend it. And then for those of us who care about health, uh, we, um, again, I will emphasize that fiber optic networks do not require wireless technologies to be attached to them. They can be attached, but we really love having the option of not attaching them because even insurance companies will not insure wireless tech company or wireless technologies because they know the real science and data shows they're harmful to humans and other living beings. Thank you. Thank you, William. Okay, next up, we will turn to the speakers in the room. I have, and I'm going to say the first names because some of these I'm just unable to read and I don't want to butcher them. So I'm not sure if there's any similar first names. So I have Otto and then William and then Robert. Start with that lineup. Please state your full name for the record and um, ward if, if applicable. Otto Patisha, 1820 Kona Street in Eugene. Can you speak louder? I'll try. I'm here to speak about re Resolution 2225 that was passed at Executive Session October 6th, 2022 which authorized the manager to negotiate terms and conditions for the conveyance of the headquarters property. The eWeb executive session minutes do not discuss or provide any guidance or selection criteria for the manager's task in conveyance of the headquarters property. This is especially important if more than one proposal was to be considered. The prior and canceled RFP did list criteria which gave heavy, heavy scoring to the proposal that offered the most community benefit. In the past two weeks, there have been a great deal of community interest and continues to grow daily in this conveyance pro process. The community has and continues to be more aware of the importance of this transaction. The community's perspective now suggests that this has become a great deal more than simply disposing of an empty building and property. The current changing of interest and conditions suggests that it is an opportunity for eWeb to be a major civic partner and a legacy within the community. This is a formal request for the board to take direct action and rescind resolution 2225, remove the property from the market and to provide the necessary time for input and development of a proposal that provides more than just the disposition of the property. An alternative action would be to amend or delay resolution of 2225 and provide the manager with evaluation criteria to support his selection and negotiation and that criteria to be developed as a part of a public process. This is signed by 215 co-signers and grows every day. And I will give you a count. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next time William. And after William Robert, followed by Marta. My name is William Enchop. And I just want to speak in opposition to this decommissioning. Uh, it costs almost the same as return to service. A loss in revenue over a 50 year period at your current prices based on my bill would be a half a billion dollars. That means if you're going to replace that, you're going to have to go out and buy it. It, it takes away the resiliency of the local production and turns it over to some hedge fund that owns wind farms or solar farms. 
I think it's the wrong approach since from what I understand from our your staff, there's nothing wrong with the dam, nothing wrong with the powerhouse. It was recently upgraded and the only thing we've got is a couple issues with FERC apparently with some seismics uh, along the canal down toward the ponds. I am flabbergasted that the number is over a quarter of a billion dollars to remediate a five mile canal. It seems outrageous to me, especially when over in the Oregon Central Irrigation District, they, the irrigators were upset about having to pay $42 million to rehabilitate an eight mile canal. Now I know this is different, but it just seems like I don't understand the justification for those numbers. I also was not very happy with the numbers that were provided. They weren't provided until the end of October. Then we get this decommission email this morning at 1030 approximately. The one of the things that bothered me was return to service 2036. It's already a licensed facility. We're just relicensing. If you clean up the canal, you should have that back online by no later than 2025, 2026. That's how what I base my numbers on. If you have to build a new, brand new powerhouse like Luffman, yeah, I could understand 2036 on that. The other issue I have with the numbers that were presented, they were based on wholesale electricity rates. You don't sell, you sell retail. You don't sell it wholesale. You're not selling that electricity back into the market. You're using it locally, at least as far as I understand. I don't know. I'm not an expert in this. So another thing that bothered me was the spot prices that were presented in the presentations and what the EIA says are available or the available this past summer were widely different. There was they were they were you guys were quoting twenty dollars. They were quoting a hundred. Uh, Robert. Uh, Marna and Grace. I am Robert Stretzer. I live at 45129 McKenzie Highway in Whitehead. I am president of McKenzie Watershed Protective. We are a conservation organization dedicated to the preservation and protection of the McKenzie Watershed, McKenzie River. I had a big long presentation uh, to give tonight, but with your uh, with the staff's recommendation released this morning, it's no good. So you're going to get a real short presentation. Uh, I speak tonight in support of the management decision to decommission Labor Dam. This has been a long and difficult decision process. You're doing what's right for the river. You're doing what's right for the river. This will be the biggest change in the history of the river and a step towards healing this natural resource. We want to thank you for returning the McKenzie River to its pre dam condition. This is historic and it's very exciting. However, it's only half of the issue. Walterville Canal has exactly the same problems that Liebert Dam has. Specifically, they're both licensed under the same federal license on the same river built at the same time. Walterville Canal as Lieber Canal. It's a 12 mile, 100 year old dirt ditch. It leaks. And it leaks so much that it's received two high hazard warnings from the feds. Lieber Dam, Lieber Canal received one warning and was closed. Walterville Canal impedes fish migration. The canal totally closes the main channel of the river. 
There is a dam on Walterville Canal. People don't talk about it very much, but there is a second dam on the Mackenzie, and that's at the head of Walterville Canal. It's a crude dam. It's made of, it's like a jetty that goes across the river and blocks the river, diverts the flow into Walterville Canal. There's no navigation there. You're stuck. Unless you take out at the boat landing uh, at the head of the canal, you cannot navigate the rest of the river. High water temperatures caused by dewatering is remarkable. It's harmful to fish, native fish, as well as migratory fish. Minimum flows in the water left in the river are so low that navigation is difficult and at times impossible. Thank you, and that's your time. Okay. Thank you very much. And you're welcome to submit for free. We have some So we have uh, Marta, then Grace, followed by Ben Martin. Hello, my name is Marla Brukoff and my address is 2094 Lake Isle Drive near Valley River Center. Uh, I have been a Eugene resident and EWIP customer since 1944, and I've been associated with the arts most of my life. And I just would like to speak regarding the resolution 2225 and encourage you to please wait on deciding on the disposition of the building near the waterfront. Uh, so that consideration can be given to making it some kind of a community center, which is supposed to be a prime consideration when you decide what to do with the building. Um, there's been very little awareness in the community that, as far as I know, of, of plans to dispose of the building. Yet just in the last week or two, uh, we have been kind of taking a grassroots effort to find out the interest in making the building a community arts center, and it's been tremendous. We've collected well over 200 signatures. And I'd like to point out also that there are a few uh, college towns of this caliber that do not have a cultural and visual public arts center, both for rotating shows from outside and also for local artists. And I think you could find there are probably over a thousand artists in Eugene who would love to have this use made of the building. But in any case, I'm asking you to please delay deciding on the disposition of the building until consideration can be made for some public uh, community use. Thank you. Uh, next up, Grace. And yeah. uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Grace Brailer. I am the Wildlands Director for Cascadia Wildlands. We are a nearly 25 year old and uh, nonprofit conservation organization that works to defend and restore Cascadia's wild ecosystems. We envision vast old growth forests, a stable climate, rivers full of wild salmon, and vibrant diverse communities sustained by the unique landscapes of the Cascadia bioregion. We have over 12,000 members and supporters near and far, many of whom, like me, are EWAM customer owners, um, as well as folks who use, visit, and really love the Mackenzie River. Thank you for this opportunity to comment in strong support of staff's recommendation to decommission the Lieberg project and remove the Lieberg Dam. We urge the board to vote in support um, of this recommendation when the time comes. We support removing the Lieberg Dam for the many benefits for imperiled species and other wildlife that, re that rely on the Mackenzie River, including bull trout and spring chinook salmon, both of which are listed under the Endangered Species Act. These species need cool, clear water to survive, especially as the impacts of the climate crisis exacerbate the stresses that they face today. A natural food free flowing river will aid fish passage by removing delay, causing barriers and maintain necessary flows in the Mackenzie River, meaning lower temperatures, higher oxygen levels, lower turbidity, all of which will assist the listed species in their recovery, as well as support a healthy, resilient ecosystem for generations to come. We recognize the complexity of this decision and do understand the desire to maintain flexibility in its implementation. We relatedly want to note our concerns about impacts to upriver irrigators who rely on these canals, on the canal, excuse me. The current recommendation um, includes repairing and using the canal, but it still preserves the option to incrementally return a portion or the entire project to pre-project conditions. 
an incremental return to pre-project conditions uh, could be a good way to allow irrigators to possibly find a new water source um, for the future. And we do hope that eWeb continues to work with these irrigators to support finding long-term solutions moving forward. Uh, we also urge eWeb to commit to restoring this portion of the Mackenzie in full and make a plan for an incremental return to pre-project conditions. The board has been presented with an historic opportunity to restore the stretch of the Mackenzie River to its natural free-flowing state and to pursue an energy portfolio that prioritizes climate-friendly efforts to reduce demand and increase efficiency. Um, so we just want to thank you very much for the opportunity to provide input um, and thank you all for the care, time and effort that's been put into this decision. And finally, uh, Tim, unless Dylan joins us. OK, all right. I'll check in hey, for Tim. a second. I would like to give my time to Robert, uh, my three minutes. Thank you. Is that permissible? Well, I mean, it's a lot more. I believe so. <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay. Well, right. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Yeah. Thanks for representing. So I don't want to break the rules here. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's important that the board know uh, how much appreciated uh, supporting the staff's recommendation is, and we, we just encourage you to uh, to vote for uh, in favor of, of uh, decommissioning. Uh, we welcome discussions on Walterville Canal. Obviously, that's going to be a longer term. Endeavor uh, probably going to go on for a couple of years. I think it's noted in the uh, uh, in the staff recommendations that Walterville Canal is looking like at 2030. Uh, I think that's much too long. Uh, it's stress that fish are under the, the endangered fish on the river. Uh, I don't know if they can take that many more years. Uh, the salmon return when they first started measuring salmon was 40,000 a year. This year, the salmon return was 1,459. That's how serious it is. I think we're very close to having all fishing, salmon fishing, uh, ended on the Mackenzie River because of that. Um, but thank you for your the, the report that the staff did was spot on. They touched on every issue that we were concerned with. So uh, we, we appreciate staff's effort uh, in putting that together. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, to comment on uh, was the holiday farm fire. Uh, as a holiday farm fire victim, uh, uh, we had to rebuild everything in our business, our house, uh, everything. Um, eWeb staff was excellent in that effort and the assistance programs that you provided, uh, the professionalism, your crews uh, up and down the Mackenzie are outstanding. And they did a great job for us in, in rebuilding. Uh, they do a great job virtually every day in, in keeping power uh, going up there. It's, it's just very much appreciated. Thank you. And I will also note that there were nine uh, people that submitted written testimony. We have um, those listed in, in here as well and are available to you. With that, I will close the public comment section. And I will open it up to comments from commissioners. I don't know, if, Frank, do you have anything that you'd like to on first off, otherwise we'll. I think there's more to come on the Liebert topic. Um, I also know that there were a couple of people who testified on resolution 2225. Um, that is by resolution administratively, just so the board knows, um, to rescind a resolution, you would have to do that by resolution. Um, although if the board were to decide to go that direction just via action, I would respect that until a resolution could be could be drawn up. Um, the, the delay of, uh, I, I will say that, you know, a couple of things. First of all, resolution 2225 was not passed in executive session. It was passed in regular session. Um, under the guidance that you provided me, 
uh, relative to negotiations. Um, and those limits were discussed in executive session uh, for uh, Oregon revised statutes. Um, their, uh, their request or their proposal, which is to uh, take the headquarters building off the market for anywhere from six to 18 months, I believe was the, the request up to 18 months. Um, there are some potential um, purchasers um, who would meet the board's criteria um, potentially within the next 30 to 45 days. Um, it would be a, a board decision if you wanted to forego those opportunities in lieu of uh, rescinding the resolution. And that's, that's that would be a board decision to place that direction on myself. And at this time, we don't have that item as an agenda item currently. Right. We also we have we do have uh, comments later. There is a set there is a section on the agenda later for discussion on labor, but also nothing on fiber. Just wanted to be clear for audience members. Uh, John Brown, anything from you online? Uh, no, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm going to wait and see what everybody else says about uh, the request to suspend the resolution because I do have an opinion on that, but I kind of wanted to wait to have others chime in before I stated that. I'd like to thank everybody else for their testimony. I appreciate it, and uh, and I'll just wait to see uh, where it goes on the uh, resolution. Any other commissioners like to comment? Sure, I'll start. Uh, thank you all for making the time to be here and and provide testimony. It really does influence the way that we think about and um, and address the decisions that are in front of us. And as you're all aware, there are a, a few very hefty decisions in front of us. Um, I actually don't have specific response to any specific comments. Um, I think it would be valuable for us to at least have some brief conversation about. Um, get clarity, not just walk by the request to um, address the headquarters building. So I propose that we at least get head nods tonight so that people aren't wondering where we're going on that. I just want to have a brief conversation, a head nod to have a conversation. About that. So we can get that added to the next agenda I've seen in Paul's ground room. Is that uh, the next agenda for January? For those who uh, we don't have time. I mean, you're saying that there's something 30 to 45 days potentially. Feedback to Commissioner McRae. We could be, we could have entered a purchase and sale agreement right. before the next meeting. Right. Yeah, I wasn't. That's, that's a potential. I wasn't proposing at the next meeting. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, we can have, would we like to amend the agenda and have a conversation towards the end of the meeting then? Aaron, to do that. If, um, Sonia, if I may, I, I'm having trouble raising my hand, so I'm, I'll butt in until you tell me to butt out. Um, if, I apologize for that procedural problem with me, but um, I think procedurally we can have that discussion right now. If, if uh, whatever you want to do, it's you, you know you're you're running it, and so uh, uh, I'll I'll tell you that I, I would be against delaying this because. Um, you look at some of the examples we have in the community, how long it took the YMCA to formulate to to get that done seven years. The McKenzie Interpretive Center, they're still not done and it's taken o over seven years to do that. Eugene Civic Alliance and all of these community facilities, um, how long does it take not only to formulate a plan and a vision, but then to get the funding and, the, and, and not only the funding for acquisition, but the funding for operations. And, uh, and if we have Personally, I think if we have a buyer in hand or something um, that we should seriously consider it because we've got some pretty big things in front of us uh, and real estate isn't one of them. Uh, well, I guess. I'm trying to put John Brown on there, but I guess the clarity that I would want is. Is how you are looking at these proposals that are coming in. You say you've got a couple that 
possibly could pull the trigger within 30, 60 days. At what point do we as a board get to weigh in on whether we want, or did we uh, give you that full authority to do that without us so, picking and choosing? So yes, you did. Um, there's a couple of pieces to that. Um, part of your guidance was to take into consideration broad community value as well as the economics. Um, I have um, tried to abide by some of the original guidance that the board had around the RFP. For example, um, it's not all about money, it's also about community value. Two of the potential interested parties are public entities, and so they would have direct um, potential community value um, the other is not. So, um, and you know, I, I don't want the board to feel like I'm going to enter into an agreement tomorrow, um, but the proposal is to delay something pretty much indefinitely until a, until a community, the community can um, weigh in and, and go through a different process. So, um, that's that's my process, Commissioner, is to try to take that community value into into consideration. But the board's direction was within the guidance you provided. That the general manager has the authority to negotiate and execute the sale. Um, Commissioner Hill. So, yes, I was a little confused on that, and I'm and I'm not thinking going out 18 months or six months or eight months, but I was kind of under the impression that we would at least have a, whether it's an executive session or whatever, be able to look at the those proposals and give our input on it rather than just delegating that all to you. And so that was must have been my misinterpretation of that, that authority that I gave to you. What I could do for the board's benefit, um, this is, uh, I could basically agree this evening that um, any offer or, or contingency or purchase and sale agreement that I have discussed would be contingent upon um, having a board discussion um, prior to executing, to, to executing that. I, I would just go ahead and agree at this point with the board to do that. Um, I, I don't think that's going to impact any of the nego negotiations that are presently going on. That, that gave that's something that I would feel a little bit more comfortable and kind of the idea that I thought we that I entered into when we did that resolution. So if we can just correct that in the record if the if the rest of the commissioners concur with your approach there. Yeah, I don't want to slow the process down, but I also want to be able to say I really don't like that, or I really do like that as an as a elected official. Commissioner Schlossberg. Um, well, I want to thank everybody for coming out. We've heard different issues tonight, but the one thing that um, unites everyone is that they feel very passionate about things that go on in Eugene and um, things that UM is involved in. So thank you all for coming. Um, in terms of the property um, discussion, I feel like um, in the four years that I've been on the board, we've been discussing the headquarters. It's been a long time coming that we've kind of queued it up. Um, and I was really excited about our process that we spent a lot of time um, developing the whole scoring matrix and coming up with a committee that was going to separate the unfortunately, none of them met the criteria that we set for. So that is why we the manager um, the ability to, to take it from there. I feel like we've made it really clear that we want to have some kind of community benefit. At least that's really important. Um, and so I know that Frank knows that. And um, I just want to make sure that we don't slow down this process too much because it really has been going on for a long time and um, we have a lot of important decisions to make. So Frank, I appreciate that you will come to us with any offers 
um, just for transparency for us. And um, I um, think that we should just continue down the road that we've already started. Yeah, and I would concur. I just uh, I know there was a, a remarkable remarkable amount of effort put in on behalf of staff and commissioners in putting together um, the kind of decision maker matrix to evaluate a variety of proposals. And um, I think in order to honor that work that was done and, and this and the corner that we turned after that process was over, that um, I agree. I, I so we continue to uh, move on with your conversations as you have, and I appreciate. The offer to bring those back to us just to have a conversation before there's a decision made. And I agree, I echo many of those same sentiments. We've gone through this process. We sat through months and months of you know criteria making sessions. John Brown and I were involved in many hours with a number of staff on really thinking critically about what we wanted for the community and how that would work. And, and I do anticipate that we we go through this process that we will try to get as close to that as possible, but unfortunately it just didn't yield the results that we had hoped for. And I think that there's still an opportunity to give good community benefit, but not delay this indefinitely. And, and I do know that there were some, there were some groups in there that wanted to work with us in the building, but also ran into issues with how it was zoned and um, some potential upgrades would be required for the kinds of use that they wanted in that building for public space. And so that piece to me also makes it, uh, if we have groups that are willing to know that going into it already, they're willing to go through that process and have the funding, I would rather move forward with it because we have so many other larger projects in play right now. Yes, I, I spoke to the resolution, but I also want to speak to the the public comment and, and you know, we do have a, a tough decision coming up on the Walterville Lieber canals. Uh, and as you can see with public testimony, there's people for people against people. You know, we've heard a lot of discussion on all sides of this and no matter what we can, what we do, somebody's going to not be happy. And, and so just know that we're doing our best to to balance what we've heard from the community and what we, we need to do as far as our, what our ratepayers uh, elect us to do. So just just know that there's two sides to every coin. And I don't know where this one's going to land. Thank you. Thank you. And then I would just encourage there there were you know in the general process staff reach out. There were some items um, in the testimony that I think maybe could use a, a little bit more information. So I'm hoping that staff do reach out and make sure, especially on the, the Lieberg Dam side, that we get some of those um, items corrected. Because there is some more significant um, issues that are closing the um, power generation down along the canal. And, um, so thank you. Okay, let's move on then. We will move on to our approval of consent calendar A. And um, due to the lengthiness of our 900 pages that we had to read over the last week, um, we weren't able to get through the um, some of the items on the minutes. So I'm asking that we postpone the voting on the minutes because there are a few things I'd like to clarify. And work with Anne over the next month to get that settled so we can bring it back for both of you. I move to approve consent calendar A as the minutes. Oh, there's nothing else on the there's, Yeah, there's nothing. That is it. <laughs> Sorry about that. I should have phrased that a little bit better. So if there's. I move to postpone consent calendar A till next month. Any second? All right. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, then next up, consent calendar B. I move to approve consent calendar B. Second. I don't want to pull something. Can I just make a quick comment? Uh, well, let's have a second on the motion yeah. and then we'll comment. 
Okay. All right. And, then and, and it's just really about the threshold that we're using, which is $150,000 that I did back to us, which is actually baked into the policies, which we're reviewing tonight as well. I just want to call out that, that that amount doesn't increase with inflation. And so we have projects on there that are in the, uh, where they, I, I, it seems to me to be valuable for that threshold to move periodically so that we don't have to stop things and adjust it because otherwise we're going to be doing things that are increasingly less valuable. That makes sense. Anyway, I, just to make a comment, there's, I don't have any issues with any of the contra contracts as proposed. I think wait, that's um, in one of the policies. It is, yes. So exactly. perhaps um, during the policy discussion, we could talk about. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other comments on the items or up for vote on consent calendar B? No, okay, then I'll call. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Excellent. All right, passed unanimously. Moving out. Um, upcoming year proposed budgets and prices. Once again, I'm going to hand it over to my very capable team. Good evening, everyone. For the record, Tim Marie Harwood, Financial Services Manager, and with me this evening are Deborah Hart, Chief Financial Officer, Aaron Palmer, Co Services Supervisor and Alicia Voorhees, Lead Financial Analyst. We are here before you this evening to review the final 2023 post prices and budget. Following the second and final public hearing on proposed prices, we will be seeking board approval. This is the completion of an annual process that began last June with the capital invest planning discussions, and the result has incorporated board feedback and direction over the last six months. There have not been any significant changes from what you saw and heard during the November presentation, with the exception of the addition of the reserves table and forecast and financial ratios. We hope to be brief with our presentation tonight, leaving time for public input and to answer any additional questions you may have. So with that, I'll hand it over to Alicia. Yeah. As Tia mentioned, there are no substantial changes to the budget since we last presented in November. One thing to note, however, is that the budget document in your board packet now includes the reserve targets and projections, and those are attachments four and five. We typically hold off including these in the budget document until we're closer to the year end for 2022 balances. Uh, all 2023 reserve and ratio projections are expected to meet or exceed board targets. Uh, turning to this slide, the grid reflects the capital and O&M budget amounts for the electric and water utilities as presented last month. As a reminder, 60% of the electric O&M budget proposal is comprised of purchase power costs and is more than offset by wholesale sales. We are seeking your approval of this budget proposal tonight. This budget incorporates all of the feedback that we've gathered at the long-term financial plans starting in July the cap and capital investment check and budget checkpoints we've had with the board throughout the year. In addition to the budget, we are seeking approval on the proposed prices, price increases tonight. Both utility, utilities are seeking, seeing a shortfall in the revenue requirement due to inflationary pressures as well as due to significant capital investment in aging infrastructure and upgrading systems in alignment with the values and tenets of reliability and resiliency. The electric utility requires an overall three and quarter percent revenue requirement increase. The electric cost of service analysis results produce different impacts for each customer class as the slide shows. We utilize the principle of gradualism by smoothing over um, smoothing rates over the near term. 
the electric price proposals incorporate an emphasis on the increase on the basic charge for residential, small, and medium general service customers to better recover fixed costs. These price increases are necessary for capital investments in improving reliability in our substations, implementing wildfire safety and prevention programs, and addressing risk mitigation requirements on hydro projects. The water utility requires an overall 6% revenue requirement increase. Water cost of service analysis results also reflected different impacts for each customer. The water price proposals allocate the increases evenly across all billing determinants. These price increases, as well as additional increases in the coming years, are necessary for capital investments in large storage projects, as well as the Willamette treatment plant. The impact to EWEB water and electric bills, both relative to median household income and compared to utilities, is an important factor to demonstrate affordability. These charts show the typical water customer in the top right and the typical electric customer in the bottom left for a single family, all electric heated household. Pursuant to board feedback from the um, pursuant to board feedback in November, the water comparator chart now includes local veteran communities. The charts reflect the current prices for EWEB as well as the comparator. Water shows headroom among comparators, while electric links to the right of the middle of the path. With board approval of these proposed 2023 budget and prices, the average household will pay around $6 more per month on their electric bill and $2 per, more per month on their water bill. Now I will turn it to you, Vice President Carlson, to open the final public hearing. And so I will open the public hearing for the new budget. Signed up. I will close the public hearing budgets and turn it back. I think this is it. Do you have anything else? So this evening marks the end of a six month process that started back in June with board guidance on investment priorities with the, with the draft long term financial plans and capital investments following the new line. In October, staff brought forth updated long term financial plans, which incorporated board feedback from July and detailed draft budgets and price proposals were presented in November for additional direction, as well as for public enrollment. There have not been any significant changes from what was presented in November, and so tonight management is recommending that the board approve the 2023 proposed budgets and prices as they were presented in the board materials. I'll open it up for discussion. Any questions? Okay. Uh, a couple comments as always thank you for uh presenting information for us in a way that we can ask again and for the um you know the many questions you all fielded over the last couple of months so that we go deeper into this um, and then all things being equal uh given the inflationary period we're in while it's hard to see our prices go up by four percent i actually feel like I feel like as a utility job of containing our costs and, and trying to impacts on customers. So I, I hard, but at the same time, it feels like oh, we can have I will be supportive. Um, Brown, do you want to say anything? I want to make sure because I know it's, it's hard for me to see hand raises or there's not an icon for No, there isn't a hand raise icon. I've been texting with Ann trying to figure this out. So I'm just going to either interrupt or do something, shine my flashlight. I'm sorry. Um, no, I'm, I, it's, it's unfortunate that we have to do this and, and this isn't the first. And because uh, we've been very fortunate not to have to do this over the last five years and now we're having to do it. We're going to have to do it a lot more. And this just adds compounds to the people and it's regressive, as we all know, the, the people in the lower income brackets are affected disproportionately than other people. Um, and uh, it's it's 
begs the question we have to, you know, we, we fought long and hard to keep rates down and now they're moving way up in that uh, in that tier, but I, I'm going to support it obviously, but um, I'm, I'm going to continue to try and push to keep rates down. Affordability factor. Thank you. Cut out a little bit. I think you said support to keep rates down and maybe support affordability factor. I just want to make sure. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Salzman. Uh, well, I too am in support of this since nothing has changed since last vote. Um, and I think I'm saying this every time we talk about this. Um, as long as we make sure that for those who eight dollars a month is a hardship, that we make sure that we help out those customers too, and we kind of bake that into the budget. But I know that we do that. But I just want to acknowledge that for some people, a total of eight dollars a month is a lot, um, and I want to make sure that we keep um, a program that is needed. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. This is, has been an ongoing process over the last six or <clears throat> four months. Um, I really appreciate the fact that you took the board's input on the water increases and gradualized those. Uh, initially, it was going to be a much steeper increase, as I recall, in the water rates, but we leveled bias that out. Um, one of the reasons is, is water is a very important thing. Everybody knows that. And we have some major significant things to take to do to make sure that our water is is to the level that we want it. One of those being a second second uh, source plan. And we have to start saving for that to, to build our second source. Um, so yes, the input was heard and, and put to good use. Um, and I, I am in favor of moving this forward again. Like everybody, nobody likes to be the person who says I vote to raise prices. But everybody sees a lot of things are going up these days and we are less than what other utilities. There's one slide back there that shows that for other utilities nationwide are up 7.7%. I think wasn't that what was on the side of that slide, the previous slide. Yeah. So electric services, 11 or 14%, water 4%, we're, we're at four and, and six. So I think that we're doing our best to keep in line with, with what we can do to keep the lights on and the water flowing. So thank you. And this feels very significant for me of the five years that I've been on the board, almost six now. Have not raised rates, actually lowered rates, and then this earlier this year vote. Maybe this is maybe this last year. One time before we we voted to support the funding to do the restoration work up the McKinsey after the fire. That was the first time that I had ever voted on a rate increase to support that restoration work. And I still support that. And I know that you know during that. During the last five years, we've done a lot of really great effort to keep rates down and to support the people on that lowest income who, you know, and, and I mean, everyone right now, it is, $8 doesn't seem like a lot to many, but it is a lot to some. And so I definitely want to make sure that we keep supporting the low income programs and that we continue to, good, to do the good work that we've all been doing to make sure that we can keep rates down. And this doesn't include in the future impact. I mean, this is this is for our upcoming budget, but the forecast, once we make a decision on Lieberg, as many of your comments have you know, outlined, we are going to have much bigger changes because no matter what choice we make on the Lieberg Dam, it's going to be a major impact to rates. So I appreciate the work that we've continued to do to keep this down, to look ahead and, and do the right things that we want to do as a utility and need to do for our community. I hate taking this vote, but it is the right thing to do. So 
thank you all for the work that you do in this room and others outside this room. <coughs> With that, um, I think we will will vote on each of the resolutions separately. So we'll entertain a motion on the resolution 2227. I move to approve resolution 2227, the 2023 budget. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Next up, resolution 2228. I move to approve resolution number 2228, electric prices. Second. Second. Okay, so we're going all right, thank you. Uh, all those in favor of that resolution, say aye. 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 Next up, resolution 2229. I move to approve resolution 2229, water prices. Okay, all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All right, all of those passed unanimously. Thank you very much for all of your hard work. Thank you. We appreciated the hundreds and hundreds of pages that went into this. I, it's it's not a small effort, so thank you. I do want to clarify, I didn't give you hundreds and hundreds of pages. That was some other people. <laughs> <laughs> it was about 50. <laughs> Maybe 100. I, I always know that the December meeting is going to be at least three to four hundred pages. So when I opened up the board packet and looked at, oh, okay, it's only you know three hundred thirty, and then I opened up the second one and went, oh, that one's six hundred thirty. Now that okay, this is definitely the longest packet by far. Do, go ahead, Jason. We do apologize that it was nine hundred and seventy-seven pages that this meeting, and uh, not all of Deborah is usually the heavy hitter, and she was not in this case. So we gave you a little bit of relief. She, she did. Was shaded. That was a relief. Yeah, I don't know. All right. All right, next up we have the state legislative agenda. Jason. Yeah, thank you all. Uh, I guess I'm in the right chair. Uh, I don't see any microphones, so I'm, I'm getting used to the new setup. This is my first uh, board meeting I've testified in person here, so that would be good for me. I would usually sit too close to the microphone and over modulate my voice, so I like the new setup. Uh, for the record, I'm Jason Huser. I'm the uh, Public Policy and Intergovernment Affairs Director for eWeb. Uh, no surprise why I'm here this evening. It's that time of the biennium when the Oregon Legislature will convene for their long uh, six month session in uh, odd numbered years under the Oregon Constitution. I think this might be maybe the most streamlined legislative agenda I've brought forward to you all in, in several years. Um, there's some reasons for that. Uh, one of our two items is one we'll be playing a lot of offense on, which we're, is not characteristic for us. Um, and secondly, the other item is a fairly lar a large big ticket funding request from the state of Oregon. So a lot of bandwidth uh, will be necessary to make both of those a, a priority this session. And then also there's a little, little bit of a light uh, agenda in the legislature itself when it comes to energy, which I'll explain a little bit more about. Um, uh, the, the first of our two legislative priorities is getting a legislative remedy for a Supreme Court decision almost a year ago, which effectively put a five year shot clock on hydroelectric water rights. Um, and uh, as you all know, in the situation of Lieberg, uh, we've been in a period of non generation for a little over four years now. So it's not unusual for a hydroelectric project to find itself in a period of non-generation. This new Supreme Court decision definitely creates a predicament. Uh, no matter what we decide on Lieberg, I think this is a great poster child example of you can't rush this. These are very big decisions when potential structural uh, safety issues come up on a dam. And the amount of study and decision making and implementation, it takes the time it takes. And five years is not long enough. Um, and actually, I, I do want to clarify the plaintiffs in the Supreme Court decision. We're certainly not targeting a project that is an active uh, project in good standing with FERC. They were targeting what they call zombie projects, where someone has walked away from a project, but on paper, the water right is still valid and, and uh, attached to the project. There was no way for them to litigate it in a way that targeted only the zombie projects. So there was a spillover effect um, uh, from the legal decision. Uh, we have a 
uh, legislative uh, bill drafting request that was initiated on our behalf to, uh, towards the legislative remedy, uh, local Senator James Manning, uh, eWeb alumna, alumnus uh, was kind enough to initiate that for us. We've entered into um, multiple meetings with Water Watch of Oregon, the plaintiff in the court decision, along with Portland General Electric and Pacific Power, who also are owners of hydroelectric projects. Uh, we've had some consultation with the Northwest Hydro Association. Uh, those meetings, uh, the first meetings, we primarily took time to educate Water Watch on uh, the vagaries of being a hydroelectric owner and, and some of the challenges that can come up uh, for projects, uh, specifically when it comes to FERC regulation. And, and um, there, there's, um, I think, a, <clears throat> I would say a, a lot of acknowledgement from Water Watch uh, that there's a need for a remedy. And I think we probably could have agreed on legislative language that would have solved the issue for labor specifically at the first meeting. Um, however, again, good state policy isn't made just to apply the one single scenario uh, for the good of the order in the electric sector for hydro in general. Uh, we need a, uh, a legislative remedy that's more universal and that could apply to many other types of conditions and types of projects uh, that could be jeopardized by this uh, Supreme Court decision. Uh, so uh, there's kind of an art there of threading the needle um, to have a legislative remedy that is flexible enough to apply to all sorts of issues that might come up in the future. Uh, obviously, eWeb owns other hydroelectric projects, um, uh, as do our utility colleagues. Um, on the other hand, Water Watch is interested in... Here, bud, uh, buy your ticket for your dance tomorrow and then bring me change, oh, okay? somebody is not muted, please mute. Thank you. Uh, on the other side of the equation, Water Watch is obviously interested in this being somewhat narrow, so there's no unintended consequences. Uh, we're making progress. Um, we'll need some more meetings uh, later this month and possibly January if necessary to iron out that sweet spot on flexibility versus um, uh, narrowness that avoids unintended consequences. Uh, I recently gave an update to Senator Manning. He was pleased to hear there's progress, and certainly he's uh, standing at the ready to uh, facilitate conversations if uh, the, the parties at the table can't come to some consensus agreement. So I think it's encouraging and we'll keep you updated on the progress of that. The second legislative priority is a funding request. Uh, it will be familiar to you since it's a repeat from our last legislative agenda. Uh, we will be going to the legislature with a request for state matching funds for the Willamette Water Treatment Plant. Uh, that's a $22.5 million request. 25% uh, of the estimated total project cost. Um, as you all know, it is competitive for, for state funding. Um, we applied last session. We were not, we did not come out totally empty handed. Um, we were uh, the, the beneficiary of over $200,000 uh, to pay for a powder activated carbon uh, a treatment improvement, uh, which helps address taste and odor issues uh, that can be impacted post wildfire up on the McKinsey. Um, but this time, I think we, in, in a long session where we have more time to tell our story, um, we're going to be ambitious and hope that we can procure a larger dollar figure. Uh, there are three different funding sources that are in play, uh, general funds, lottery dollars, as well as the potential that there are American Rescue Plan Act dollars that were allocated by the legislature in their prior budget that turn out we're, the, uh, we're going to for projects that turned out not to be feasible and were no builds. It's always possible that the, some funds could be reprogrammed and water infrastructure is a qualified use for those funds. And I think we're at a stage where we could certainly uh, put some of that money uh, to work on design for the project on a timeline that would still meet um, the federally imposed timeline on how that how soon that money has to be spent, which I believe is the end of 2024. So um, multiple funding sources. I do want to stress again, it will be competitive. I, I just learned today of another water system project out there, so we're going to need to uh, get pretty good at our storytelling. Um, I think I uh, supplied the board with some talking points uh, at a, in a previous board packet. Um, I think you also know that we're working on what we call a leave behind that we can use for any of our meetings with legislators or also just enter into the official record. Um, 
I, you've seen my PowerPoint slides. I think I'm a decent writer, but we got to spit this thing up. So uh, we've got the eWeb team working to supply some graphics and maps and something that will pop a little more, especially if we know there's a little competition out there. We want to stand out from the crowd. There's um, uh, it's a little opaque uh, how the legislature develops its budget, but there are certainly many uh, opportunities for public testimony. So I'll plan to sign up uh, for any of the hearings at the Ways and Means Committee or the subs, any place we have an opportunity to tell the story about our project and uh, the benefits uh, of that project, including to uh, neighboring communities. Uh, certainly we have wholesale water customers uh, in the area that will benefit from uh, an improved, more resilient system. And um, there's a, a few other things there that I think show this is uh, a project that's regionally beneficial beyond the, the city limits of Eugene. Um, oh, and I, we did uh, have a meeting with City of Eugene staff uh, earlier last month where we talked about coordinating more on um, Inflation Reduction Act opportunities as well as IIG opportunities. We did talk about this project and uh, City of Eugene staff apprised us that we have an opportunity to forward this funding request to the City of Eugene's Intergovernmental Relations Committee. Uh, where they might take a support position. Uh, obviously, UWeb staff would volunteer to be there uh, to describe the project or otherwise answer any questions the, the committee has. And that very well could uh, you know, lead to a support letter from the mayor uh, or council. So um, I'll let you know uh, that date if there's anything any of you wanted to do to contact uh, any uh, local government colleagues you may know on the committee. And uh, also, I just wanted to note, um, in addition to the legislative process, the York staff earlier this year did meet with Business Oregon to talk about other uh, water financing and grant opportunities, uh, either in, in their existing programs like the State Revolving Loan Fund or any new programs that could be coming through uh, IIGA or the Inflation Reduction Act. And so we, uh, we're on their radar and uh, we'll, we'll be, we can be in contact with them uh, at some point in the future when we know more um, about the project needs. But I just wanted to make sure folks know we're looking all under all the stones. I think the business of Oregon's tools tend to be more of the financing nature than the grant nature, but uh, we'll see what happens. There's some new rules uh, and flexibility being given to the states for those SRF programs. Um, so you never know what, what opportunities may be out there on that side of things. So those are our two big priorities. Um, there certainly will be some other le uh, energy legislation coming up where we may be playing uh, an assist type role. Um, oh, real quick, actually, let me back up for a moment. I did want to just point out one of the reasons the energy agenda is a little light is because in the 2021 session, the clean electricity standard was passed, which requires the two large investor owned utilities in Oregon uh, to meet a very aggressive carbon reduction uh, timeline for their energy portfolios. That's a very complex piece of legislation. The rulemaking and implementation of that bill is still ongoing right now as we speak. It involves multiple state agencies. Uh, so there's work to be done left on that. There's also the implementation of Governor Brown's Executive Order 2004 on climate and the Climate Protection Program. And then on top of that, you've got all these new federal funding streams coming in, many of which utilize state agencies um, to be passed throughs for that funding. They've got a lot on their plate. I think that they're looking for just to catch their breath and I think the legislature understands that. So um, that's probably a, an explanation of why the energy agenda in Salem is a little light. We're honestly playing a little bit of catch up on past policy and, and the recent um, major investment packages approved by Congress. But uh, a couple of areas where I do see us providing an assist. Um, there is um, a few legislative concepts being brought forward by the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance. Uh, they're of the resiliency variety. They'd like to start a state grant program to uh, pay for fuel cells that could provide uh, hydrogen-based standby emergency power, something we certainly could be interested in, maybe even at a facility here like The Rock. So we'll be supporting RHA in their effort to get that program started. There's also a joint task force on resilient and efficient buildings. Um, that, uh, that group initially was looking at building code improvements. I think they're actually pivoting now 
to developing some kind of plan for the state of Oregon to be very strategic and think holistically about all the federal funding opportunities and how to leverage those with existing programs. So we'll be following closely what that committee recommends and there may be an opportunity for us uh, to help them uh, develop a good state plan. And then finally, the Oregon Department of Energy uh, has proposed legislative authorization for them to create and regularly maintain a state energy plan. They already do a state energy report, but that's a little different than having a state energy strategy. The state of Washington already has one, and I think Oregon has decided um, there should be a little bit more proactive vision on energy policy. So there will be legislation uh, authorizing the Department of Energy to do that, and again, uh, uh, update and maintain that, that statewide energy plan on a regular basis going forward. Um, I want to get to questions, but uh, real quickly, I'll just note that uh, as far as we can tell, the legislature will be resuming, resuming to somewhat normal business, uh, the pre-COVID type of business, uh, which means people will actually be uh, in the Capitol. There will be in-person meetings. Um, I'm sure it won't be exactly like it was before COVID, um, but it means we do have the opportunity to have our traditional EWEB Commissioner Day at the Capitol. Um, if you're all willing to come to Salem, I think it'd be great to resume the tradition. And if anything changes, there's always the backup plan of going virtual if needed. So um, I can um, follow up uh, through Ann and Holly to get some dates out to you sometime soon, because uh, we'll want to start asking for uh, meeting uh, scheduling requests uh, as soon as possible so that we can try to see the whole delegation from on, on the same day. And uh, lastly, uh, before I turn over to questions, I just wanted to remind you all that uh, there is one small matter of business. Uh, we do need to uh, consider resolution 2230, summarizing our agenda and our principles and staff recommendation is to approve. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, any comments, questions for Jason? John, I can see if your hand is raised, so. Okay, he's not jumping in. So, um, so there's a lot of new bodies in the building. Um, are are you reaching out to new representatives or senators and, and making introductions and, and availing yourself for them for questions? Uh, we're, I'm on the cusp of doing that. Uh, one of the reasons I'm waiting is to find out the committee assignments. Um, we certainly need to be strategic. There's 90 members and there are a lot of new ones and uh, uh, it's going to be hard to get appointments with everyone. So we're waiting to see what kind of word we get on committee assignments. The word's starting to get out now about uh, what to expect, who's going to be committee chairs on the committees that uh, have general jurisdiction over energy and water, which obviously are the, the two closest to our heart. Uh, we're very fortunate in that uh, our local delegation, I, I don't know how we've managed to be this lucky, but um, the uh, lack of turnover and having uh, very seasoned, experienced legislators that we already have relationships with, we're very, very fortunate, I have to say. So, uh, but you're absolutely right. There's a lot of turnover and uh, I'll be, um, making a point to get out there and glad hand and meet as many of them as possible, um, as soon as possible. Yeah, that's something I, I met with some legislators uh, for a different organization with two new people. And it was like, if you can get your foot in the door so that they know who to call and when they have a question, it's it's very advantageous. And so I would ask you to do that as much as possible. Thank you. Okay, and then John Brown uh, noted that he does have a question. So I'm going to go back to him and then just do the little logistics there. Thank you, uh, Jason. Um, years ago, I recall, maybe I'm wrong, but there was an effort to try and get a bill passed statewide about uh, septic tank inspection with 100 within 100 feet of a, a waterway that provides up to sale. Did that? die or did that ever get any traction or did I remember that wrong? Uh, you know, there was a bill like that. Uh, I believe that if I recall, we, we the effort tried to tie it to home inspections uh, during the purchase of a home on the basis of being right. a, consum a consumer protection measure, which uh, was a pretty strategic timing. Um, it's also a time when if there was a problem with a septic system, 
that the buyer and the seller are you know, negotiating repairs and things of that nature. So it would have been a very, uh, very timely um, moment for uh, an inspection. Uh, my, to my knowledge, John, um, the state, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Brown, the um, state Brown. initiative that passed that prohibited real estate trans transaction fees or, or uh, I hope someone else can help me out. I'm not, I'm not a real estate expert, but there was a bill that essentially um, capped or preempted uh, what local jurisdictions or even the state could do with fees related to real estate transactions. And there was a um, legal judgment that determined the inspection because there was a cost for the inspection, making that part of um, a time of sale, you know, a home transfer that was prohibited under the state uh, initiative that was approved. So I'd have to go back and that's off the top of my head. I'd have to go back and look at my notes. But as a result, I believe that inspection requirement um, could be difficult to implement in the way that we all envisioned it. And, and uh, I, I'm disappointed that that's not an opportunity. I would just for kind of the education of the other commissioners that may not have been around then, because uh, you know once septic tanks are installed, they never have to be inspected, and uh, and you know 25 percent of the septic tanks up in the McKenzie Valley failing, according based on our statistics. And I personally thought it was a good idea, but apparently some lobbyists in other venues didn't. But um, maybe some point in the future we could try and resurrect that because I, I only see that getting worse and worse and you know why wouldn't we want to protect our drinking water but um uh I'll, I'll let that go thank you jason that was a good recollection and uh it's sad to hear that that died but um maybe we'll try and rekindle it in the future uh, commissioner brown real quickly i was going to mention that in the wake of the that statewide initiative i seem to recall that carl morgenstern and i did meet with the local Realtors Association uh, and make just basically make the case to them that uh, uh, again, uh, just good business practice. It'd be great for them to apprise uh, any home buyers to have a septic inspection done. Um, so it, it might be worth uh, doing that again. I, I think it is pretty common practice for realtors to recommend that to their clients that are purchasing a home, but um, uh, we could certainly consider uh, making the case to them again to be proactive in educating consumers about the, the wisdom of doing that. So I, I appreciate that, especially in close proximity to drinking water sources. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Slosman. Yeah, this might be a question to answer at a different time, but um, you made a comment that we don't usually take off in use the offense in coming up with a legislative agenda and I'm just curious why not why don't we ever try to get more traction so for instance the the tank uh, issue well I may have overstated that I, I it's not rare it's just uh it's probably not often that we're the uh, leading an effort to make a statewide policy as a, as a local government. We certainly do. And actually on that specific point, we did. We, uh, we were um, part of a coalition that was pushing that bill to require septic inspections. I may have overstated it a little bit. I would say it's more often that uh, you know, we're part of coalitions. We, it's probably more accurate to say we don't play offense unilaterally. Um, and some of that's uh, size based. I, I I always say we punch above our weight, but um, we are just one utility in the state of Oregon, and so it's usually more part of a coalition. And uh, I would say on the the hydro water rights, uh, we are working with the coalition, but I, I would say we're certainly taking a lead role. And a lot of it is we just have such a great case study. We have so much experience with this topic right now. We're uh, well qualified to to play uh, an outsized leadership role on it. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, well, I'll just add, I would love to come up and visit in February and help move the legislative agenda. And at this point, I'll look to uh, resolution 2230. Resolution 2230. Okay. All right, perfect. All those in favor, say aye. 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 
Madam President Carlson, Commissioners, good evening. Uh, my name is Frank Lawson. I'm the General Manager of eWeb. To my left is Karen Kelly, our Chief Operating Officer. Uh, to my right is Lisa Krentz, our Generation Manager. Um, wanted to discuss this evening uh, with the board uh, a management recommendation for the future disposition of the Lieberg Hydroelectric Project. I'd like to start with I'm just setting a little bit of a few stakes in the ground around the environment of which we're making this recommendation. You know, first of all, uh, I would like to acknowledge the work of the core team uh, and extended core team, really. Um, Karen, Lisa, Mark Zinnaker, who's, who's over here with uh, Jeremy Samoji, Adam Spencer, who I saw earlier, um, Alicia Borges uh, and the finance team, as well as Ben Ulrich and Jonathan Hart and uh, other members of uh, Megan Capper's um, power planning team, um, as well as some others. This is, uh, as said here on the timeline, this has been a multi-year effort uh, so far, uh, and we want to make sure that people understand this is this is a directional recommendation. Um, this recommendation will not result in the wrecking balls uh, coming out next week. Uh, this is deal we're dealing with timelines that, <clears throat> for example, will take years, uh, potentially decades uh, as we look into the future. Um, this is our 20th board meeting on this subject over the last few years, uh, nine this year alone. So thank you uh, for your uh, many words of wisdom, as well as your efforts and in, in both outreach as well as uh, site visits, uh, collaboration with staff on this. Uh, we have um, much of it uh, through Adam's coordination uh, and the communications team reached out in a number of ways to members of the community, uh, both upriver uh, and in the city of Eugene. And so we really appreciate the feedback that we we have gotten. We've received a lot of it, um, whether that be direct through emails, conversations, uh, testimony, and one-on-one um, -on -one conversation. So we really appreciate that. The team, and when I say we this evening, I'm referring primarily to the core team. Uh, we really do appreciate that that feedback um, from commissioners as well as from the public. Um, I want to emphasize that. The recommendation this evening is a conditional recommendation. Uh, we recognize that as we move through this process that there are, are conditions sometimes that change. Uh, some of those keep you on course and some of those make you step back and uh, we want to be willing to look at the future as it changes. And if something uh, as we go through this process over the next number of years uh, warrants that we review a decision that we've made, we will do that. This is this is conditional. We, we are making this recommendation based on the best information we have today, uh, but we also know that the future uh, can be volatile and we want to be able to respond to that. We also recognize a couple of things relative to the impacts of this decision uh, and the disproportionate impacts, whether it's where you live or what community you're, you're part of, um, how you and and to what degree your bill weighs into your your personal uh, economics. Uh, and we also recognize that while we have listened and we have contemplated this decision to great extent, uh, we know there will not be complete agreement on all of the different aspects of, of the decision. Uh, that's that's part of why it's an important decision. It's also part of why it's a difficult decision. We appreciate uh, that the board recognizes uh, that is such. 
quickly just review this. This is just uh, really this past year's schedule. We've we've had a number of check ins with the board on various issues from uh, water quality uh, to water rights to different financial scenarios to triple bottom line exercises and, and input. And so we appreciate that. Uh, again, recognizing that uh, the board has committed a significant amount of time to provide the best advice and collaboration they can with the team. Uh, we also uh, wanted to take a look at this from a couple of different um, angles uh, this evening um, and explain the process that was used to come up with the recommendation. Uh, first of all, we know that we started with a number of, of defined alternatives. Uh, we narrowed that down to four. And then part of the exercise around the recommendation was to dissect those alternatives and the subcomponents that made up those uh, alternatives and the decision factors that went into that. For example, uh, one that's very fundamental is do we uh, want to continue or does it make sense to continue to generate electricity? Uh, that's a subcomponent that affects um, some of these alternatives more than others. And then, you know, that can lead to a decision around the dam, that can lead to a decision around how we use or potentially use the canal and other assets such as such as the bridge. So uh, when we approached this, we didn't just look at this and all cast a vote for a particular alternative. We looked at the subcomponents of those decisions and said, how does this relate to eWeb's mission and the impacts that it's going to have on the utility, our customers uh, and the community? Uh, part of that um, is to look at this um, from not just the aspect of the triple bottom line, which we'll talk a little bit about later, but also relative to how does this align with uh, eWeb's mission as a utility? And so we, uh, when we looked at, at the decision and the recommendations that we're providing, uh, we wanted to take a look specifically at our mission as a utility, our organizational values. Um, how does this, um, is this consistent with our customer owners priorities? We also wanted to weigh the different alternatives and the parts of the decision relative to ongoing risks and uncertainties, long term obligations. And finally, wanted to understand the resiliency of the direction um, or recommendation that we're providing. Are we making a decision that does allow for conditional adjustments in the future? That's what we would mean by the resiliency of the decision. A little bit about the, the path. Um, we started with the, the question, should we, or does it make sense to generate uh, in the future at Lieber? Um, the, um, the answer when we looked and the, some of the considerations was that it really just is not economically viable relative to the alternatives that we have. And I think that's, that's an important <coughs> distinction one of the things that we looked at, and I'll, I'll show it a little bit later, is that um, the way that Lieberg is classified as a facility is it is listed as a uh, as a direct uh, facility to, to to deliver to load, which means if we take that asset away, that we have the option to work with Bonneville at a, on a tier one replacement. And so the viability has to be compared with what is your replacement cost, which in this case would be a Bonneville option. We also just looked at this relative to future generation and said there is uh, high regulatory and economic risk. Uh, and this really creates a decision that is rigid in the long term. And what that means is that um, if you decide to generate at Lieberg, not only are you committing to the present license period and probably through 2026 or sorry 2076 the condition of the assets are such that whoever's making the decision at that point would probably be obligated to go for another license um, if you decide to decommission after 2076 then the economics become that much worse because that's when you start to put in your sinking funds uh, to decommission in 2076, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And so the rigidity of the decision is you're not just obligating um, the utility to generate at the site for another 40 years. It's probably more like 90 to 100 years. So it's definitely a long-term decision. 
once that you look at whether to generate uh, at Lieberg or not, um, the dam decision sounds like DAM, not DAM, and uh, the the dam decision is one that falls out from that, and it is it is highly unlikely that. The regulators, first of all, would let the dam remain after its primary use has been removed, but also relative to the settlement party positions, the ongoing risks, liability and long term obligation uh, far outweigh the recreational benefits that the dam provides. And that's that's our uh, that's our opinion. Also, we then rolled into the the canal and the bridge um, from a practical perspective using the canal for stormwater uh, conveyance, stormwater management as the most practical initial approach. Um, there are some, it does lead to the fact, and this is the, some of the arrows down below, it does provide some options depending on even future financing and availability for grants or other things for environmental recovery that it could uh, provide a practical option to move from an alternative for or alternative or with no bridge um, to uh, an alternative one, which would be the full decommissioning. So there's some flexibility um, in that decision as we move forward into the next phase of the plan. Relative to some of the economics, I think you've seen this before. Um, all of these bars are going down, uh, which is that present value, uh, which is an ultimate cost to our our customer owners. Uh, we have put the, the no bridge alternative in there as well. Um, it is part of the recommendation as to how we would how we would address that. Um, but we also feel like when you look at our our mission, uh, we are not a transportation organization, although we do understand the need to mitigate the fact that the dam also serves as a mode of transportation across the Mackenzie. This is really when you look at the, the cost of the different alternatives. Uh, one of the things that we did was we took a, a baseline minimum approach and we said, what is if you stripped away everything and said, what is the absolute minimum that we had to do? How much would it cost to add generation on top of that? And how would that compare with the alternatives? And when we looked at the investment required to add generation to various alternatives, uh, we were looking at what's called, a, in, in this case, LCOE stands for levelized cost of energy. The cost of energy that those alternatives produces is significantly higher than any of the other alternatives that eWeb uh, could pursue. Um, and this is really the costs that have been aligned within our integrated resource plan. And the ones in green there are actually carbon free options. And so you can see that. Uh, what we would do in this case is we would petition the Bonneville Power Administration administrator to replace the energy lost from Lieberg with tier one power, which would be at that $33, roughly $33 a megawatt hour. Whereas you can see all of the various alternatives to self-generate are, are well over 100, um, 117 in the two alternatives, uh, two and three. And then those actually increase to roughly around $200 per megawatt hour if you were decide to um, delist the facility or decommission the facility in 2076, um, which then you add that sinking fund in, um, and uh, which which makes it just that much uh, more economically inviolable. There is a rate impact. Um, we've recognized that. Um, with the, the recommendation uh, from, uh, from staff and management is probably gonna be estimated in roughly the 10% range if you look at uh, the decommissioning with stormwater conveyance, um, less about another 19 or 20 million uh, for the uh, removal of the bridge as part of that alternative. That takes it down a little bit below the, the double digit, although again, there's some variables in those those estimates. Um, we also do recognize and will pursue uh, any grant or federal or state options that we can. 
once we have a direction set forth. Uh, one of the things that to consider, I know Jason mentioned uh, the the IRA uh, um, Inflation Reduction Act and also um, the IIJA Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act um, as potential sources. Most of those are for new facilities and for new infrastructure related to to um, uh, renewable energy. They would this facility would not qualify under those conditions typically. Uh, there may be more options relative to environmental recovery uh, than there would be to pursue grants for generation that already exists. And we will pursue every form of uh, financial mitigation that we can uh, to help mitigate any rate impacts. The other thing that we have looked at and we recognize that there are a number of different different opinions on this. We had to look at the alignment uh, of our recommendations or potential options uh, with our customer owners priorities. Uh, historically uh, and most recently, our customer customers have told us once we achieve a reliability um, threshold and a water quality threshold on the water side, that affordability becomes their, their number one concern. Uh, in fact, it, it, and the reason I say that there's a threshold, um, if you think about what's going on in Mississippi or you think about what's what's gone on in some parts of the country, uh, Flint, Michigan, for example, uh, they're in a position where it doesn't matter what, what it costs, we need good water, we need reliable electricity. So once we achieve that threshold, then cost and rates affordability becomes their, their key, key concern. In fact, our most recent um, survey did also reinforce that very specifically stating that eWeb should prioritize reliability and affordability in our decision making process. That was a very direct question to customers and that was their response. In some of the surveys specific to the Liebert project, um, we did find that uh, there was some difference between um, people who responded from Eugene versus upriver. Uh, upriver respondents did place a higher priority on some of the social impacts, whereas Eugene residents placed a higher priority on some of the environmental impacts. And that's that's probably not a surprise based on the specifics of, of the project. Part of the other analysis that we did, and we did this with the board as well, uh, we did this uh, with staff also. We looked at the triple bottom line components. There's several reasons that I think this is an important part of the process. Um, one is it provides guidance in, in your decision making process, but also it identifies the key areas that you may want to mitigate or consider uh, and identifies those conditions of which we said this is a conditional recommendation. What are some of those conditions that could impact a future uh, direction or a future adjustment? Uh, these are a uh, pretty extensive list of things that we want to make sure we're considering uh, and verifying, uh, reinforcing or alternatively not reinforcing going forward. And so uh, that was part of our process when we looked at the alternatives. Um, we also uh, looked at the alternatives oops, back up on that one, uh, from a board perspective as well as a staff perspective uh, by applying weights to this. And I don't want to to emphasize this too much, but um, both the board in its conglomerated results um, as well as staff uh, and the project team when we went through our equivalent or parallel version of this. In both cases, the alternative four uh, provided the least negative um, of the different alternatives. And then internally, we also did uh, a comparison between alternative four and alternative four with the no bridge um, enhancement or uh, addition to it. So the, the summary of the recommendation based on the process that we looked at, which was a combination of the triple bottom line uh, and also looking at attributes and alignment with the organization resulted with uh, a six point uh, recommendation. One was to 
permanently discontinue electricity generation at the Lieberg site, thus re really driving the requirement uh, to remove Lieberg Dam and develop a southern access uh, as an alternative to the use of the dam as a, as a transportation means across the river. We also um, looked at the most practical initial approach to the use of the canal being to uh, repair the canal, um, partially repair the canal specifically for stream and stormwater conveyance. Uh, but as part of that, preserving the option to naturalize or progress to that uh, full decommission option one. I would say also relative to the first point on there to discontinue electricity generation. That is one thing that we would pay particularly close attention to as we get into um, negotiation with settlement parties. Uh, we, we recognize that it's a premium investment to regenerate at the site, uh, but we also want to make sure that uh, understanding that differential and if for some reason differential becomes closer or is driven to a closer um, um, difference between generating and not generating that we're in a position where we could reevaluate whether to generate or not in the future. Uh, but our recommendation based on what we see now is to discontinue generation. We also understand there's a number of mitigation opportunities that we need to include in our next steps, um, including water rights and specifically hatcheries. Uh, one of the, the things that came out in the survey, both in, in the city of Eugene as well as upriver with the importance on fisheries, um, that was um, very near the top of the list for both demographics. Um, and we consider that an important part of the economy of the environment um, in, in the region. And then we're also recommending that we do conduct a similar assessment um, on the Walterville project. Um, the, uh, the Walterville presently is generating. It is generating a return. Um, and we believe that there's an opportunity as part of its relicensing process, which uh, would start really in roughly the 2030 timeframe that prior to that, uh, that we conduct a similar assessment uh, with Walterville. It is a, while it's tied in the license, uh, it is a different project. It has a different profile to it. It has chevrons instead of a dam, and it was, it was viewed as a, a, whether that's navigable or not, it's, it's not. Um, but we also think that Walterville should be looked at separately from, from Lieberg as one of the next steps. Just to reiterate where we are and where we're going, um, this is a recommendation. Um, we are looking for uh, to incorporate commissioner feedback uh, this evening, um, hopefully, um, and as well uh, as doing it in a way that makes you comfortable. Our next step would be to convert our recommendation to a record of decision for which the board would formally vote to endorse that record of decision and that record of decision would set the, the course uh, and the path going forward. That launches us into uh, the development uh, of an implementation plan um, that would um, align with the recommendation around Lieberg's uh, decommissioning as a generation facility and the stormwater conveyance um, use of the canal, which when you look at the at the future, there's this is why I said this timeline, uh, there's a number of different processes in this in this step and the, the implementation plan launches us into this part of the of the project. So uh, there's a number of lumps, if that's, that's a technical term, lumps of years where we are looking at various um, regulatory and license and administrative requirements, implementation measures, approvals, um, and really uh, construction not taking place until all of those requirements are achieved. So um, our recommendation is, is set forth um, as such, and we would Welcome, Commissioner. Discussion. You have 
a number of different potential options. But tonight's potential outcome could be that you would direct the general manager to prepare a record of decision consistent with the proposal recommendations discussed this evening for deliberation and potential endorsement or action in January. The other option would be to do something similar, only bring that back as a record of decision for deliberation in January, further deliberation. Um, and then the board could decide that further deli deliberation is warranted uh, before we convert our recommendation into a, a record of decision for your consideration. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Vice President Carlson. Thank you for the time this evening. John, do you want to get in the queue and then I'll go to others? By the way, um, uh, okay, here, here, here. Uh, thank you, um, Frank. See again. Your internet was cutting out. Can you out. hear me okay? Oh, now it's better. Okay, thank you. I'm, I apologize. It's uh, the squirrels are running long and hard this evening down here to try and keep the, keep the internet running. Um, I, I'm really pleased with uh, with the, with the recommendation. I, I think a lot of long diligence and in, in review has gone into this. I do have some a few specific questions or minutia, but they, they're important to me. And so I, I, I'm assuming that if we take the dam out, then that means the salmon hatchery goes. Is that correct? Or are we going to talk about somehow? I, I know that I've been told we can get water to the trout hatchery, but to the salmon hatchery, is that off the table? I, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I just had curious. Yeah, Commissioner Brand, this is Lisa Krantz. Um, I'll yeah. take a stab at that. Getting water conveyed all the way down to the salmon hatchery that takes water off the Lieber Canal would be difficult. Um, I think what we would propose to do is partner with them to see if they have other opportunities to get their water, but a source through the canal seems unlikely. Okay, and then um, uh, what happens to Lloyd Knox Park? So as part of, uh, we would assume if the board endorses this uh, record of decision and this this recommendation, we would move through a license surrender process. As part of that process, we are likely required um, to to look at recreation opportunities, and there would be likely some ongoing requirement to provide recreation opportunities. What that means specifically for Lloyd Knox Park, it's a little too early to tell, but that would be part of the process that we would go through that would include uh, discussions with our stakeholders and other interested parties. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm, I mean, just to, to summarize it, I'm, I'm supporting this and I'm, I would be proposed that I would, I'm ready to move forward with the record of decision in January, uh, unless I hear something from others that would change that. Thank you. One thing I did want to add, and, I, and I'm, I'm doing this because I know that there were some comments made about it, about it earlier, that we do recognize that there's opportunities to mitigate some of the impacts of, of the recommendation. The recommendation in, in full disclosure also has its risks and uncertainties as well. For example, uh, you know, while it, it doesn't create a market risk, um, there uh, we are relying, putting a, a heavier reliance on Bonneville, for example. Um, and so I think it's worth acknowledging that. Um, I do think that risk is significantly less volatile than relying on the market, but is a risk that we need to know. Also, there is the loss of the localness of a resource. Um, there are potentially other ways that we'll have to look to mitigate and understand the resiliency impacts of, of the recommendation. And so um, that is something that would be part of a mitigation effort. Um, as Jason uh, touched on earlier, this would involve the surrendering of our hydro, hydro water right um, as part of this. And also we did want to understand, you know, really um, it does uh, result in the loss of the lake, which, can, which will have some local economic impact as well as some 
local firefighting support impact. So uh, we, we do recognize that, the, that this is not a perfect recommendation, um, but I think we have gone into this eyes wide open uh, and the benefit of using a triple bottom line approach is it does give us the opportunity to really look hard at various opportunities to mitigate um, potentially adverse or negative impacts. Thank you. Pretty much just want to jump in. All right. I have a couple questions. Um, so a question about maintaining the canals. Can you just talk to me a little bit about why we would opt to have to take care of something that is just for water conveyance? Yeah, the, the so the initial recommendation being to continue to use the canal for stormwater conveyance is really based on the economic uh, advantage that that has over the full decommissioning, which is one of the most expensive options. Um, if we were able to get some environmental recovery money or something like that, that would lead to the full de decommissioning of the canal, there are options, there, there, excuse me, there are advantages to that, such as removing the long ongoing O&M and obligation that we have to that. Um, but the initial recommendation is to be to do the canal as in a, as practical a way as we can, which is probably to start by using it that way, unless unless we learn otherwise. Um, another question is the impacts to people who live on the lake. So I, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are really nervous about. I know there's a lot of people that are really nervous and concerned about this decision, and um, would, whatever it is you decide to do will impact people up there. At what point do we start working proactively with people up there to try to minimize the risks there are or to mitigate whatever kind of negative effects? How does that process work? You were going to start. I was going to weigh in and then I'll, I'll Jeremy can jump in. Uh, I was just going to Really, the, the next phase after the recommendation, um, record of decision and the endorsement is to develop a plan that includes those types of activities, um, as well as the outreach to other stakeholders, the processes that, have, that are involved in that. And so this recommendation, the record of decision, really launches that part of the implementation plan, which Part of that would be um, having conversations with a number of stakeholders, those included, if you want to elaborate on that. Right, and I think one of the first and foremost things we'll do once the you know decision of record is, is implemented is to you know have another stakeholder engagement plan through our communications team, which they've done a great job thus far. So we'll just take that to phase two and take that out to the community upriver and in town and uh, just you know, have more listening sessions perhaps that take more of your time, unfortunately, uh, towards that effort and to, to get the word out and to to just reassure folks that this is going to be a long term process and there's there's a long time to to negotiate and to mitigate uh, the, the issues that will that will happen upriver. One more question, if that's OK. Um, I know when we had originally talked about this and, and are making a decision that we had talked about how we're not actually making a specific decision, but we're making a decision to go down a path to explore a decision. And I'm curious the way that you've laid it out. Once we make a decision, like if the decision is to um, decommission, whether with stormwater conveyance or without, once we make that decision and start going down that path, we're, are we down that path? I would say that um, the record of decision certainly starts us down the road. There are, there are so many negotiated processes in there. And I'll, I'll just give you one example. If we, we cannot have a discussion with Bonneville around a replacement alternative unless the board has approved the decommissioning path. And that's the, the same with some of the settlement parties and as we open up the license. Um, 
you cannot go to FERC with hypotheticals. They, they just will not respond. Um, and so we have to have a course laid out, a plan laid out to be able to do that. The caveat to that is that there, there could be some game changers along the way that would warrant our, uh, our re reassessment. But for the most part, it sets the course going forward. Um, now you can maneuver down that road somewhat, but in essence, the fork is in the road and we're, we're, hit, we're starting down that road. It would, it would be incredibly, and I think that Lisa used, said this term one, it would be incredibly ineffective and inefficient to jump to the other road. I think that's what she said. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. That's right. So. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so if we, I guess some of my questions are on the regulatory side. So if we pull the trigger and say, to FERC, we're going to surrender the license. Are we confident that they're going to let us keep Walterville at least to 2040? I'll, yeah, I'll take that. We actually did, but following the board workshop we had at the end of October, we did convene a meeting with FERC to check our assumptions to ensure that we were telling you all accurate information based on our experience with, with FERC. And uh, essentially, no, we wouldn't take an action with FERC. FERC won't take an action until we apply for something. And so we've got that step to do. What we end up applying for um, will determine what happens with Walterville. And so that's why we're, we're starting down this path. We're going to start trying to get some more certainty, start talking with stakeholders, start looking at what this really looks at, looks like um, before we apply um, for a license action with FERC. That said, there's no reason for us at this point to think that, you know, we've got a license with Walterville through 2040, and our intent is to continue to generate through 2040, uh, minus some unforeseen circumstance happening. The other question on regulatory. As I recall, if we did return to service, that meant a higher level of resiliency on the canal than if we just use it for storm water. Does that is that assumption right, or do we still have to build into the million year flood that FERC wants us to? I'd like to love that over to Mark, yeah. Uh, so again, yeah. that would fall maybe in an uncertainty category, but our expectation would be that um, if, if we're not a FERC regulated water conveyance, in the future, that we would not be expected to convey um, necessarily uh, at the same level of reliability as uh, if we were generating facilities. So, so who would be the regulatory body on a stormwater conveyance berm? Is, would that be regulatory? To the state of Oregon? Or? I was going to also add, Commissioner, that we did an economic assessment of the sensitivity around what the difference in cost would be between a say a 10,000 year flood standard versus a million year standard and I think it was about 2%. So it that particular requirement should not be does not drive the economics a lot. It it sounds ridiculous when you say it, but it's from an economic impact perspective not significant. Um and then timeline and this just goes to the public I looked at the timeline you had up there. Construction begins 2032-33. So when you say that, there may be construction along the canal before that for me for mediation and immediate stuff now and probably canal work, ongoing canal work, but 2033 is when they would start yanking the dam. Is that kind of what that timeline shows to me? Yeah, the, the folks will see construction along the canal in the near term as we do our near term risk reduction measures to ensure that the canal is safe to convey stormwater in the short term. The, 20, the early 2030s, and it's our best guess at this point, is for major construction for the long term option implementation. I would caveat that that there's a lot of work that needs to be done between now and then, and the regulatory process can I've rarely seen it take 
less time than you expect, but I've often seen it take more. And so I think the 20 early 2030s is uh, it's our best guess, but it could be longer than that. Mr. Borofsky there with we'll, we'll make sure we follow up with this, but we did have a, an estimated cash flow chart that shows the expenditures per year. So I saw that and I, and I was just doing that basically for the public that's here that if we move forward with the record of decision, that doesn't mean that the dam is coming out in the in the near future. It's probably in the next decade. Be probably the best guess. That's just for public knowledge. I think that's a message that we need to get out. Whatever way we go. Thank you. Sure, I'd just take a minute. Um, it feels like the evening of unpopular decisions for sure. Um, <laughs> but, um, I, you know, we have all into this, this decision for a long time and thought long and hard and had a lot of conversations about it. And I really appreciate the, the session that you called uh, was it late October, where we had just four hours of open conversation to really walk through this and helped me understand better the, the whole, you know, the whole project in the context really helped, I guess, form my thinking about it. Um, I think for, for all the reasons you state in this recommendation and especially just the risk of ownership and just the uncertainty, the regulatory uncertainty that comes if we try and uh, need to operate this facility. It, I, I certainly think that this is the best way to go. It's as we've talked about, there's no there's no good option here, right? It's all the worst or the the, the better of bad options. Um, uh, I'm, I'm supportive of this and I appreciate all the effort that's gone into thinking through this six ways, probably a dozen ways from Sunday. Um, so thanks to the whole team, all the effort to get us here. Great, I, I appreciate that, certainly. I The one thing that I, I don't want this recommendation to send the message that this was a decision between fish and power um, or fish and electricity. O oftentimes decisions around that involve dams are. Um, we tried to look at this much beyond that, um, looking at the risks, the regulatory risk, the climate risks to generation, for example, from a water perspective as well, um, and not turn this specifically into an electricity versus a fish issue. There are, uh, by removing the dam, the unobstructed flow does have water quality, has navigation, has rec some recreational benefits, fish benefits uh, to it, but we, we didn't want to portray this as uh, a discrete fish versus electricity issue. There was a lot more that went into it to, than that, and I and I know that the commissioners elaborated and went through that with us. So I I wanted people to understand it wasn't one versus the other. I'll jump jump in. I I really appreciate the thought and the recommendation, and I as I mentioned before, you know the the cost is one that is going to be a big driver for me and one of the biggest reasons why I'm supportive of the direction. Um, the power generation issue, it's so risky to me that, you know, will we be able to do it? How long can we even get power out of it? How much water will actually be flowing through? I mean, our climate is changing. It's going to look very different. The amount of water up there be very different and the community and the wildlife there they're are going to need it. We're going to need the, the quality that we can provide by doing other work there to continue to provide water for our community. So thank you for all of the, the hard work. I, I will be part of this. I, I know that at our last meeting, especially in October, we wanted to do more outreach um, I would still like to go into the public. I'm willing to support this this evening, but then I want to still go out into the public and talk about 
the reasons behind you know, why at least I, I support this. It's very, very critical that we show that this is best of the worst. There aren't any great decisions here, but there was a lot of effort that went into this, and none of the impacts are. There's going to be winners and losers. So it's just the way it is. So. Mr. Carlson, I think your out your outreach intent is consistent with our intentions as well. We we are starting to plan a number of, di of different events in the coming months. Uh, some of those are highly linked. You know, this decision, IRP, both of those dealing with with resource issues, those become a a, a nice natural fit to be able to go out and speak with the public about. So. Um, be coordinating with you a lot on that and other commissioners as well. You know, the one that that I mean, as I mentioned last time, I, I wish that we could keep the dam, but I completely understand that that is tied to the power generation and with the power generation being so right and it's essentially far more costly than what is even in this that get into a project like that and the fees associated with it and the legal process and all of that is just so risky to try to, to redo that. Um, so I understand why the recommendation came out to keep the dam, even though I was trying to look for kind of a could we get rid of the generation, but also keep the dam so we could have the recreation side of it. Um, I understand where staff is coming from and I do appreciate that the extra effort after our last meeting to reach out to the various regulatory agencies to and confirm those points that we were grappling with. All right, with that, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, oh, yes. um, you know, when I got on the board, and even before I got on the board, I knew this was going to be a, on, on our agenda, and I was a full build it back, put it back to where it was, you know, and the more I learned, the costs, all of the things. I see where I see how we landed where we're landing. But that said, after that meeting that we had where we went through all of these things, I would like us to, if we do move forward with it in this direction, continue <coughs> to look at the full decommission and try and bring the whole corridor back to pre. Take it all out. If, if there's if there's money or ways that we can do that, that would be something that I would be leaning toward. Matt mentioned it at one of our last meetings. It's like, yeah, it's more expensive. But it takes away all of our liabilities. It puts the rivers, it puts Johnson Creek, it puts Cogswell Creek. None of us know what Johnson Creek and Cogswell Creek looked like before this dam went in. That could have been perfect spawning uh, things for these trout. And, and Sam and, and Lambert, we don't know because none of us are around and know what was up those creeks 100 years ago. Um, so I would want to keep those options open, especially as money comes in and bring that back and say, you know, right now we're, we're you're saying it's a two to three percent higher cost to our rate payers. But if we could get that down to a half or one percent, I would like the board to have an opportunity to weigh in on that and say, is the cost benefit there for us? So that's something that I hope we can continue working on it over the next decade. And John Brown, your question. Um, yeah, just a comment and a question. Uh, Mindy, did your concern about the uh, the lake going away? Um, but there's a some pretty good examples in uh, on the Rogue River where they've taken out two dams recently in the last five years where they were lakefront homes and now they're riverfront homes. And so I think staff and people will be able to use some some real life examples of uh, how that transition occurs. Um, I have a question about if 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 there is a you know sentiment for some to uh, to return to service, but if we did that, and then got shut down five or ten years later because of the water flows, and and, and uh, then wouldn't we have to also? I mean, we spend 250 million getting it back running, and then we got shut down. Wouldn't we have to spend another couple hundred million tearing it down after it was shut down? That's correct. So we, it's a huge financial risk 
if we return to service and then the flows are such or the regimens are such that we can't really use it and then we have to shut it down and we just spent a quarter of a million dollar billion dollars on it and then we have to spend another couple hundred million tearing it out after that that would double our expense or am i wrong no that's correct commissioner brown okay so that weighs in on me about the about the, the overall cost i know it's an expensive option to, to tear it out but it's it's not the cost it's the cost per year i mean i um the future liability we could be strapping ratepayers with it could be double what we do if we return to service so uh, that weighs heavily on me Um, so to your point, John Brosky, about um, the full uh, pre-project conditions, uh, my understanding is that we're, if, if we choose to support this, we go down that road, and that road includes plenty of options that we don't have to decide on now, and that will just become probably either clearer or more complex <laughs> as we continue down that road. So we're not cutting anything off, but we're not making decision um, and so I agree with John that if we do um, go to um, this or support this that um, I too would lean towards looking at a um, full project conditions um, but we'll get to that when we perhaps later um, my other thing is just about a comment that you made Frank about getting uh, rid of a local generating facility and um, I just want to make sure and I know we will but that we, we keep that as a placeholder when we look at the IRP and when we talk about that more I know that as a board we've indicated that we value locally owned generation but we haven't really delved in and talked about like what does that mean and I know some people might look at this and say well you, you're Potentially looking at getting rid of a local source, so I wanted to make sure that we circle back to that, and um, it's something that the board has already indicated. So, or Schlossberg, I, I do believe that in the context of the IRP, we are going to run sensitivities around sort of checking the value of localness relative from a transmission perspective. Um, and the value of localness really being um, from a resiliency perspective, which is probably the primary driver for that, not necessarily that we are enamored with owning or operating a facility locally, it's the value that its location brings to how we approach resiliency and reliability. That, that That's what I have read from you and the other board members is that's that's probably the primary driving reason. And I think your point is absolutely correct in the context of the IRP, which we're in the middle of also, has to be a consideration. Uh, just one comment to Borowski's point about, um, I, I, I too would be supportive of a full decommissioning if there's a way that we can make that make sense. And I understand there was a remarkable cutthroat run that went up Johnson Creek prior to this project. Are you around in the 20s? I was not, but I took spoke with some people in fisheries who uh, said that that would be one of the benefits if that's the way things went. We will plan on incorporating that, uh, Vice President Carlson, in the record of decision. I think we've, we've tried to make it clear that we are recommending this as an initial course, but using the word we are preserving the option to pursue the full decommissioning um, if that turns out to be um, practical and feasible. So what I'm hearing is that at least from two or three board members that that would be something that, that we should incorporate in the record of decision. Yeah, and, and from my perspective, it's just the cost piece that's so different. Right. If the outlook was much closer, the decommissioning because we have less liability over the long term. But, you know, continuing to operate and maintain, uh, it's still surprising to me that that's that it's so much less than just 
cutting it. It, it does seem over the long term that. But I know there's there's a lot more earth moving that comes out of it. So. All right, so then I think we need to decide. Want to. Oh, it's just direction at this point, so you would bring us back for vote in January. I'm interpreting the feedback that I'm I'm getting is to pursue with the conversion of the recommendation to a record of decision. We will bring it forth for potential action in January, but if the board wishes to deliberate the specifics of it a bit more in January, and we have to make some adjustments at that point as well, uh, we won't resume any uh, necessarily approval of that action, but we're, we're getting general support um, and feel like we've gotten the direction that we will bring back for a proposed record of decision in January. So I have, I have a question on, on a record of decision. Can we can you put in there? Timeline check ins with the board into that record of decision saying that we want specific check ins as to. Decision points, uh, you know, not just like, OK, go. You've got the record of decision because once you get that in your pocket, if it's an open, if it's doesn't have that in it. You or another general manager or other staff can take that record of decision and, and move forward with it. Is there a way to build in check ins at certain periodic points where we can look at? The, the full decommission and you know, say at, at two years we want in or at three years, the board wants to know what the implications would be of a full decommission as opposed to a stormwater conveyance. Is that something that we can build in as well? We can build in a number of different ways of working with the board on that. I'll, I'll have to figure out what triggers those. Those would be uh, the commissioner. Um, the board already has certain spending authority, so if we're going to we're going to be spending money, the board's going to know it. We also can build in certain reporting regimes and other things. Whether we have all of the specifics relative to a milestone map for decision, I'm not sure, but we can. We can have some discussions. I think what I'm hearing is this is not a set it and forget it kind of, the, you know, authority that you're granting that we want to be able to have ways that the board can continue to participate, monitor, and be part of the process. And so we'll. I guess I would ask my other board members: Is that something that you would be would be interested in or or supportive of? I feel like it's. I mean, this is much bigger scale, but similar to the um, water storage tank. Um, we did a record of decision for that, and then we had like periodic updates and we got it more. Um, but I think, are you talking about having something that's more structurally like? Well, I mean, structured? We, we've, we've had updates on the water tanks, right? But we haven't weighed in on, I mean, this has, this has a bunch of different hoops that have to be jumped through and without us kind of putting it into the record of decision, it doesn't necessarily mean that we we have input on that other than the budgetary input. So I, I just it's such a, a generational and legacy project that I and I'm sure that it's Frank's it's Frank's intention and staff's intention right now to do it. But I don't know that Frank's going to be here in two years or five years or ten years when these when these decisions are going to be made. And so that's why I'm trying to, to kind of protect it so that there are periodic check ins and, and approvals of the board on the direction that it's going. I would state just from an organizational perspective, having clarity around that would benefit myself, would benefit any sort of executive leader, staff as to providing guidance around that. So I, I don't think you're what you're asking for is perfectly reasonable, in fact, beneficial. It helps with the transparency. It helps with monitor where we are in the process. Um, there are some next, what, what I don't know, and I'll have to work with, with um, Karen and Lisa and the team on is, are there specific milestones that we can call out as part of that? Or is it, does it start with just periodic? 
and then it evolves from there. So we'll we'll have to I fully agree with what you're saying. I think it's to the organization and the community's benefit to do that. I just don't know quite how to structure it yet. Okay. And we can do that. We'll incorporate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, last quick comment on that. Um, I mean, if there's some new information that causes any thought of maybe this isn't the right path, there's a, a change in the line of thinking and just periodic updates. There is a way to build that in and certainly be supportive. Um, to the point about local control too, um, I mean, we did, we, we voted to re-up Carmen. That's significantly more, you know, much bigger generator. What's the scale again of Carmen versus? The, the nameplate on Carbon, Carmen is about 100 megawatts. Now its average output is typically 28 to 30. 25 to 30 average megawatts. One of the differences in Carmen and Lieberg is Carmen, there's a certain ability to shape the output so we can generate higher outputs at, at peak times and then back off as we manage water. Lieberg is simply run of the river. So whatever the river is, there's a limit on how much we can run through there. So it's a much different type of generator and it's much larger. What's the scale again, just for purposes? It's like it's, it's three times larger. Right. Think of it that way. From an average output perspective. Okay. Peak is much different. It's more than that. Okay. I just wanted that for folks in the room. <laughs> okay. All right. So with that, um, not seeing any other comments. Do you have what you need? Oh, Karen Kelly. I'd like to just say one thing and. Coming from my 27 years of experience, never have I ever worked with a board who's been as engaged in any decision as I have with all of you in this one. And I just want to say thank you because as you mentioned it being a legacy project, this team has had this weighing on us for a long time, heavy on our heads and hearts. And knowing that you're engaged, you're paying attention, it's just as important to you and to your constituents as it is to us, it just, it means a lot to have that support and that engagement, so. Okay, perfect, well, wrap it up and we'll come back for another round next time. Okay. All right, we have scheduled a break. We're going on time, let's do that. Let's come back at eight. Well, real quick. <laughs>
Hi, we're going to get going again. And it looks like Ron is up. <laughs> okay, well, I hit the thing. No, I'm going to start. Uh, good evening, commissioners, staff, uh, everybody out in virtual lands. Um, record, my name is Rod Price, I'm assistant general manager. Feels like we can all take a big breath here. This is going to be a light and airy conversation, probably compared to some of the other things that we've done. But we'd like to talk a little bit about organizational goals tonight. The the post some um, in the the background, or you can probably see those. Uh, so we'd like to get some feedback on that and any other priorities that, that we have. I'll go through a few things, and, and probably this slide looks familiar. Uh, we thought uh, it was shown last year. In fact, most of these slides will look familiar. Uh, but I just wanted to remind people where we're at in the process in, in the goal forming. Um, right now, we're in the, the yellow section there, talking about uh, drafting goals. Uh, and these are organizational type goals that, that the staff will then take after they're approved and start building the, the work plans for, for the following year for 2023. One of the things that, that struck me when I was thinking about this presentation a little bit is uh, you can see the strategic plan is this big overarching thing that, that we all work with and, and uses our, our guiding light. It feeds into the the yearly organizational goals that we're going to talk about. And I think it was kind of interesting. We just got done voting in the uh, or approving the 2023 budget, which also funnels up to the, the long term financial plan. So the long term financial plan is, is the guiding light for, for our financial pieces. And this is uh, the strategic plan and, and the, the goals are how we get our activities appropriate. And I think it was Commissioner Carlson last year brought up an interesting question. So why why do we plan our goals after we plan our budget? And, and that's uh, stuck in my mind a little bit. And so as we went through the process this fall of both budget and, and talking about our plan and, and where we're going, it, the, and again, this is not a perfect answer, but, but there's a lot of synergy between the strategic plan and the long-term financial plan and how they, they work and interact together. And so, uh, I, I think that even though sometimes that kind of seems a little out of order, and if you're probably to get down to the minutia of detail, yes, but in the big picture, the strategic plan and the goals we come up with are working alongside the, the financial plan. There's also, uh, uh, I guess I could uh, also refer to one of my favorite consent items. Uh, it says staff will manage variances through the budget process and board policy. Well, you can see here, we manage our organizational goals through our our feedback loop, which is the reporting uh, through the quarterly plan. So that's just some thoughts on that. This slide, I think I'm going to skip and just sort of combine with, with this one here. And again, we talked about these last year. Um, we, we tend to group our, our goals into several uh, uh, groupings. And the way I kind of think about it is we, we do a lot of work and, and, and we need to do that work really well. And, and our mission is to deliver water and electricity affordably. And, and all these things. And so they, these are the things that, that we need to do really well. That's the business fundamentals. And sometimes things come along like uh, substations blow up or, you know, whatever it is that breaks and uh, we go out and fix them and, and we address them. Sinkholes, I mean, we, we've heard a lot in here about uh, problems and issues that, that come up. And so there's other goals to target those. Now we have to do both of these things really well and we can't get to our strategic uh, work and the strategic work is of course things that we want to do different in the future. These are things that are going to uh, change our business and, and move us forward to the next generation, that kind of thing. But you can't do those kind of things without doing your basics well. And so we wouldn't be building a second water treatment plant if we weren't doing our first one well and if we weren't doing our, our business fundamentals well. So. I just, uh, we put in some typical kind of things here to illustrate um, some of the goals, the things that we think about 
uh, to help you think about prioritizing and, and so forth, just to give examples. So the other thing I thought about a little bit, and so on the slides here will be the, the five uh, goals essentially that was put in the background or uh, you don't need to read them up. You probably already looked through them. And, and so at the end of the this few minutes here, we'll, we'll go back and, and allow you folks to, to talk about these and I can thumb back to these if needed. But there's three things that sort of struck me when I when I looked through these. The first is that, that words matter and, and working with Frank, I've, I've really a deeper appreciation of that. And so as an example of that, um, if you look in the background, you'll see goal number one says uh, operational performance. So I changed the word from operational performance to operational effectiveness. What's the difference? Well, in my mind anyway, performance is something you do. Effectiveness is something you do, but it also has an idea and, 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 and it conveys a sense of how well you're going to do it or, or what you're going to do. You know, it doesn't have to be, it has to be good enough, right? So, so I think there's some ideas there that um, could be played with as, as we uh, finish these out um, for the final approval come January. Second thing that jumps out to me is that, that people matter. And I all the time talk about getting stuff done and building things, but uh, we need people. And that's the goal number two's target workforce culture. It, you can't do things with without uh, attracting and retaining and, and growing uh, employees, right? And so, as you think about number two, there, there's a lot going on, um, but those are targeted at trying to meet the, the things that we need to do with people, and, and the how how we use people and how they get done how we grow people. So uh, the third thing I'd point out is, is priorities. Um, and again, uh, going back to goal number one there, you can, if you have been thinking about priorities through the year or, or whatever, now's your chance to kind of bring these in. And so the example is, is this goal number one where we've said, okay, we're, we're doing our stuff, um, but we also need to focus on data management. And that sets us up for two things. It sets us up for a, a more efficient operations. We've got all this data out there in management that's kind of uh, all over the place. <coughs> so we're gonna improve our operations by, by, by having a plan to put it in one place. But we're also gonna set ourselves up for our strategic goal of EES. The EES, um, to implement that efficiently then, uh, needs con combined data. So that's just an example of that. And with that, I'm just going to turn it back to you, Vice President Carlson. All right. Comments, discussion. If you want to jump in and um, I can't see you, but if you'd like to jump in, please wave or give me an indication. Okay. Not <laughs> All right, Matt. All right, I'll just. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll wade in. I'm going to narrow in on one thing in particular, um, but then I, I may come back for a second round if that's okay. Um, I overall, I think the goals as they're proposed here are are the right ones. And you all thought a lot about this, and though I think you may have invited us to wordsmith <laughs> just now. I don't think that's actually what you intended to do. <laughs> <laughs> we would appreciate feedback. But to your point about, you know, about um, precision with words, um, there's uh, the the DEI goal, at least as it's kind of referenced here, is is under workforce and culture, and there's no question in my mind that that's a big piece of of us addressing DEI within the organization in terms of hiring practices and, and the way that employees are treated and things like that. But I also think there's a component of DEI that's how our customers um, interact with the organization. And so from my perspective, I, I would be in seeing that DEI goal uh, more reflect that kind of global uh, approach than narrower approach on workforce. Focus. 
Yeah, I think yep, yeah, both internal and external. I, I I think have to be together. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll jump in. Um, I would echo that as well. I'd like to see what the EI clause is. And other than that, I, I do think I like the change of the word to effectiveness. And right where you were going when you said performance versus effectiveness, that does it actually shows that you're have a, a goal that you are achieving. It's not just okay, I've done what I needed to do, but it it had the measurement <coughs> the change there. And uh, otherwise, I mean, I expected that the goals would be. Or narrow because the goals themselves are so large that we're not going to have so many that you know we really want to focus in on the projects that we have going on and and this in and of itself is still an amazing amount of work so I like how succinct it is but also recognize that it's it's still a huge undertaking. All right, Commissioner Slosser. Um, I appreciate how the first two are kind of meta. They're not like specific projects, and then the, the last three are more like specific, um, like with the, the enterprise solutions and the uh, IRP and the um, second source, like those are specific things, but the first two are more really about culture. So I, I appreciate that you've taken kind of like a, a dual look at the organization. <coughs> but, um, Um, yeah, kind of building on that, um, I like that how the fact that we measure these and we see them on the quarterly reports, um, and you know, and some of the other organizations that I'm involved with, the strat plan. I want to see things fall off the strategic plan. Some things can live forever, but I I like to see you know this is three years and. Do it and get done with it. And that's what some of these other ones down, you know, the EES, the, you know, some of those things, the, the obviously the meet, you know, the the meterings and those types of things, someday we'll we'll drop off that, right? Um, and so that's important to me as well. You know, I think a strategic plan, we should be adding things to it each year, but we should also be completing things each year. And that's where the the little the little uh, you know gas gauge that we see on the on the quarterly reports gets us, and I would like I, I like the fact that we're we're doing that, and I like to see that ones that have finite things are more towards the green, and that we can drop them off because that gives us the capacity to bring on new things, and that's you know if we're if you're spending all your resources on things that are just going and going and going that were meant to be dropped off. Then that's something that I, I would give give thanks to. But um, you know, uh, things like DEI and some of these other ongoing goals of the thing, resiliency, effectiveness, positive workforce things, those those live on forever. But also I want measurable things that we can do it, move on, and find other important things to do. So that to me is one of the balancing that I think you've hit here. Thank you. John Brown, comments? I'm, I'm good with, with what I've heard. I, I don't really have anything constructive to add or say, so I'll just say thank you very much. What are you saying the KPIs that fall out of these? Okay. Um, do you have the direction you need? I do, thank you. Okay, great. Moving on to the next, we have annual board policy review. So it's the 600 pages. <laughs> We're now on page 923. <laughs> 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 we would like to actually have a section where we talk about the customer impact um, or the, the customer survey outside of this. Anyway, we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> that was a large chunk of the 900 pages. Anyway. Yes, so um, 
Vice President Carlson, commissioners, good evening. Uh, there's there's a couple of purposes that we have slated for our annual review of board policies. One of them is that we recognize that there are a significant number of board policies um, of which govern how we interact, uh, whether that be delegated authority or um, certain conveying certain priorities of the utility. And so we have um, a recurring opportunity in December to review anything that the board has noticed or, or wishes to, to bring up with staff. Um, the other piece of it is that um, we agreed when we were changing policies or modifying policies that, that we would let those run for a little while and provide those as opportunities uh, for the board to, or to to see if there's any additional feedback. It's sort of like a like a pilot program. If you want to take a little bit of a shorter look at a policy that's been modified for some reason or another, and and there were a number of them that um, over the last couple of years have have been modified for different reasons. Some of them administrative, some driven by a special circumstance. Uh, such as board attendance, we that used to uh, reflect um, in-person attendance. We obviously uh, got away from that during COVID, so we wanted to um, operate, op uh, operate in, and recognize the difference in um, the requirement there. Uh, some things that that we've discussed um, discussed earlier, um, and then. Yeah, you know, we do have a few that have been suggested or, you know, one that we just talked about um, in the, the diversity, equity and inclusion. Part of that being proposed in our 2023 goals. That's something that we will work with the board to develop, not just for the policy itself, but for uh, the purpose uh, and the, the driving reasons why that's important to the utility and, and you as community representatives um, and of the community both directions. Um, and then also it has been suggested to me by, by Commissioner McCray that, that um, we look at a policy uh, kind of similar, it may be in structure to our climate change policy, but something around resiliency uh, we do recognize that from a policy perspective, we view resiliency not just from an asset perspective, but also from a financial perspective, from a workforce perspective, uh, for example. And it, it may be an opportunity, this is something for the board to discuss this evening, uh, whether that kind of policy would be helpful to the board. Um, <coughs> that there are times when strategy rolls over into policy. This would be an example of, of that. Um, the climate change policy is another one of value that is is driving some of our strategy. So that's that's something um, that you can provide some back on. And then I, I heard one earlier um, around um, the limits of authority for the board to approve. I, I think Commissioner Mc McCray uh, brought up the 150,000. Whether that's still appropriate, this would be an opportunity to review that. Um, I will say that that originally um, was set, and um, and then we, um, as part of that, I can't remember if it which EL number it is. Uh, TMA know we agreed to report quarterly any contracts between. 40,000 and the 150, which is the board approval. So quarterly, you see a quarterly report that talks about all those contracts that are in, inside of that window. And if we were to push that up to a higher level, then we would also look at that. We would want to look at that reporting um, structure as well. So this is an opportunity for the, the board to provide feedback, discuss new options. Um, we are proposing one specific change uh, that we can bring back if the if the board uh, indicates uh, support for this, and that's in the the climate change policy adjusting the baseline year from 2009 to 2010. And that's um, it was originally set in 2009. That's where we were in the process. We had enough data to support 2009. 2010, however, um, better aligns with the city of Eugene's baseline as well. So we thought there was some benefit there. Um, 
to uh, to align with our with our local community. So that's a specific request. And then um, another one for your consideration um, is to whether we would look at um, changing our approach to minutes um, now that we have technology and recordings available. Whether we the board would be supportive of going to what would typically be referred to as action based minutes um, that would include you know, who's in attendance, what the subjects are, basically approvals um, and those types of things, as well as um, agenda stamps to be able to track um, a recording where it was actually deliberated. And so um, as opposed to. I'll say a, a novel of what we're talking about, trying to uh, abbreviated novel. It's a re reader's digest version of what we're talking about. Um, it would be more of a here's the actions that occurred. Here's what was discussed and then um, here's where you can find that discussion in um, a different form of media. So that would be something that would, would actually st save staff a pretty significant amount of time. Um, other than that, this is this is for your feedback, your comments, um, your guidance. Mr. President Carlson, I'll turn it back to you. Great. You want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah, jump in. I don't think that novel will be very uh, easy to sell. I I completely support the idea of reducing the detail of meeting minutes, given the technology we're using today. I think that makes a whole bunch of sense. Thank you for proposing it. Uh, the purchasing controls policy. Um, I did a little bit of quick math, and so the policy was adopted in 2017 for $50,000, and if we followed inflation, it would be everything over $180,000 today. So it just, you know, there's just that kind of constant creep, and I think um, trying to, to build in that ele escalation so that we're not constantly having to debate whether or not we're right, asking the right uh, threshold would be useful. I don't, you know, whatever is easiest, in my opinion, would make sense there. And I don't, you know, I don't know if the rest of the board is interested or not. I know it's a little bit trivial, but. Oh, it's, I, I, I would say that from a, from a staff perspective, we take all procurement seriously. Yeah. Um, whether that's 10,000, 40,000 within the threshold, outside of the threshold. Uh, there is a process by which we think that it's important for you as community representatives to be a part of. I like round numbers, so I would not tend to. I I would say, so, you know, something that's a nice round number, 150, made some sense. You know, does that mean I might go for 500? No, I'm just. I I, I don't exactly care what the number is. I think it's up to the board to decide what you're comfortable with. One of the things that we did look at when we bumped it from, I think, 100 to 150 was how many contracts does that really entail? Uh, you have a feel for what it entails now. Some of those may fall off. Um, again, I think your intent is to sort of keep reviewing this. So I'm, I'm comfortable with changing it, but the, really this is this is where is the board comfortable with, with what we're doing? Um, we do report all of the ones that um, are below that above the 40,000. So it's if, if the board wanted us to bring back something that's that's scaled a little bit more today's dollars, we'd, we'd probably bring back 200,000 just to ground it. But I, I'm, this is for the board to provide guidance on. Well, I have a follow up comment on that particular topic. Yeah, and I remember when we had, uh, because it was during my time, we moved it from 100 to 150, and that was when started doing more of the reporting on those smaller grants. Um, and some of that was due to a, a timing issue, right? I mean, they were smaller, and then we had to wait 30 days to get the board approval, and it, it was more hindrance to the general operations of the organization. I, there's there's a trade off for the administrative pieces of it, but like what like I said, I I don't. I don't want to convey that we we just because we, we don't look at this and go oh let's keep let's do three contracts at 149,000 to get around the board that that's not what we yeah, we were very specific about so <laughs> we, we really there there is a trade off in the amount a, a little bit of trade off in the amount of administration we do but I I can't say that 
there would be a huge difference between 150 and, and 200. I, I think to Commissioner McCray's point, is this something that we just want to continue to evolve and pursue? It is 200,000 is point oh five percent of our budget now, so it's it's becoming increasingly small detail, but I, I'm going to defer to the board for what you're comfortable right, with. It looks like John Brown has a question, so I'll open it up to him. Is, is it on this same topic? John? Yeah, it is. I, we're just okay, talking great. about the policy on the amounts that, that come to up on the consent calendar. I, I was around when we did 10,000 and uh, and moved it up, but Matt, there's a, there's a reason to have oversight and whether it's 150 or 200 because I'll, I'll go to the story of when we had a $77,000 contract to plant some grass and staff had it in at a prevailing wage or paying $44 an hour to plant grass and we, we we did it and came back and cut it in half because we questioned it and so um, it wasn't the dollar amount it was the message we sent to the people about don't just make an assumption and that's real money and it was it was more the concept of, of doing that. And so it's it's not that I question staff and, and whether or not what they're doing is right. And it's like I know you had a question or somebody had a question about the, the woody debris up in the on the river and why is that doubling again? Um, I still want to be able to look at look at those and whether it's 150 or 200, that's fine because I still look at the ones on quarterly too. So um, it's it's just to make making sure that uh, you know we're supposed to be good stewards of the public's money, and we watch how this is spent because there's some pretty big contracts and the little ones are just as important as the big ones to me. So I'm okay with raising it to 200, but I just just want to make sure that it doesn't say that we're not going to keep looking at it. You have a comment on it? Yeah, a comment on this. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> I agree with, with John Brown. I mean, $50,000 here, $50,000 there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. And, you know, earlier on we were talking about $8 a month means a lot of, a lot to some people. Well, $50,000, $150,000 means a lot. And I, I'm with John Brown. Those are the ones that I look at. When I look at the consent calendar, I read through those. And and if I've got a question, I'm going to raise it. And I'm I'm perfectly fine with 150,000. And you know, the the process is already in there. We're not changing any process if we leave it at 150. So I'm I'm fine with leaving it at 150. I'll have other comments on okay. the overall. Yeah, and just to wrap it up for me, and then if you want to say anything too, I, I'm fine with the 150 and just leaving it as is right now. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, I'm not fine with 150, but I, what I'm hearing you say is that periodically, at least we look at this so that, you know, it's not 20 years from now and we're still looking at contracts that are $150 and you were just trying to build in something where we didn't have to, like, stay on top of it, but. Yeah, but I also don't have strong feelings. Yeah. I think you'd, you'd be a 25 year board member. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I think one of the more important things that we look at is the difference between consent calendar A and consent calendar B. So con consent calendar A, if we follow our standard processes and for example, go out for RFPs, develop you know three bids and come through, that comes through as consent calendar A. Consent calendar B is structured a little bit differently. So if we don't get the appropriate number of bids, for example, that's where it goes to consent calendar B, or if there's a direct negotiation or there's a resolution. Or, so we decided to go with two consent calendars almost because if you if you go, if you want to not approve a consent calendar A item, it starts the whole process over again. And that actually by itself can be very expensive. So that's why we decided to go with two different types of consent calendars as well. Okay, all right, so we've, I think we've kind of covered that particular topic, then um, just general policy comments then. Slosberg, did you? Sure, I just, I support um, shortening the minutes and getting time stamped. I think that's it. And then the only other thing is, um, I know you're not specifically asking about the DPI policy. We're going to talk about that later this year. I just really want to make sure that with that, uh, we're just going to be part of it. Not so much like what 
you know, it's a proposed for the agency, but I think for us, there's probably whoever is the consultant do some work with us just to make sure that as a board that we are using best practices and that are aware of anything that, that how we can improve the DEI. Agreed. Um, yeah, I'm fine with the two recommendations going forward. I, I still have a little bit of pause on EL4. We talked about that in July. Uh, that's the extraordinary or the compensation and benefits and being able to pay bonuses and sign ons and stuff like that. And I'm still a little leery about that with the state law saying that give a bonus to one person, then everybody in that class has to be offered that same thing. So I just want to make sure that that's been really run through through the Bureau of Labor and, and our on our legal department because I know yep. it was suspended. It was suspended during the pandemic, but it's not suspended anymore. And and I just want to make sure that we're OK with that because what it says is that you can give sign on bonuses. You can give uh, the limited term objective based pay agreements and stuff. So I'm just want to make really make sure that. What we did follows the, the bowling laws. Yep, absolutely. It was legally reviewed. Also, I think there's there's the caveat that um, within these policies that staff reviews those periodically from a legal perspective to make sure that we're being equitable in our compensation practices, for example. So that's that's absolutely part of it. And, and to that. It's it's kind of the same thing that that was talked about earlier on when we were talking about trying to build the workforce culture. You know, if 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 I hire somebody on and I'm teaching them how to do my job and they're getting the twenty five thousand dollar bonus and I'm doing it, that that can definitely go to culture. You know, we've seen we see it in the nursing trade right now when traveling nurses come in and are being trained by somebody and they're making. $50 an hour less, so I, that it goes to that. So be very prudent and judgmental when you're using the alpha, that, yes. that policy. Absolutely. John Brown, any general general comments on the policy? I got to unmute. Sorry. Um, no, I'm I'm good with uh, the voice rest of, as written and proposed. I'm I'm OK with the way it's um, thank you. Okay, well, I'll jump in. Um, I appreciate the, um, the effort to put in a resiliency and look at a resiliency policy and what that might entail. I think that's a great recommendation. I was reading through the policies, the environmental policy and the sustainability policy. I don't know, sort of seemed like maybe they were something could be combined. I don't know. Maybe there were maybe there is a piece there, but um, I also noticed that there were some of the policies that had concluded. Maybe there was one that looked like it concluded, and I was just wondering if that could be removed if it was done. We'll take a look at that for sure. I'm looking at steam utility transaction. Yeah, yeah that it could, it could be. Yeah, that could yeah, be. it was. It's done. Okay, you don't really need to keep that on the books anymore. We'll take a look at that. Okay, and then um, uh, supportive of moving 2009 to 2010, if that kind of helps us align with the city, all for that. And then in terms of the minutes, I, I paused on this and I thought. I like that, that people have the ability to search through the minutes, but I'm guessing most people don't do that anyway. And so if we if we only have the records and people really want to know more about how we got to that, I would actually rather them look at the video because I know the staff to their best of their ability, you know, try to summarize what we say, but that's really it's really hard to capture the, you know, the emotion and the work that we convey in it in just a few words in a small summary. And so I recognize and I recognize that that takes a lot of time. And I'm often the one that has <laughs> issues with it. So I am supportive of moving away to just a record of decision. Um, in spite of the fact that I asked to fix it for the next month. We'll fix that and I will, but <laughs> yes. We'll note it in these minutes that. Yeah. You... 
Thank you, Board. Yes, yes. Uh, thanks for bringing up the, the greenhouse gas change. It would be nice to know what that figure is, what the difference between 2009 and 2010 is. And I don't mind changing it, but I think we should know what that number is and still uh, try to achieve the 2009 goal, even though we're, we're basing it on 2010. So if we could know what our internal GR that one year difference, how much it is, and if we can, you know, we, we can find out what's yeah, we'll, what Yeah, when we propose the change, we'll. That, that would be something that would be helpful to me. Good point. Let's not delete our goal. <laughs> the intent of the change was not to make it easier somehow no. and make it look like all of a sudden we've achieved something additional. Right. Enough. But we can quantify that. And, um, and I think we should still try and reach the 2009 goal. From an absolute perspective. Yes. Mr. McCray, um, you were the one that proposed to be the um, resiliency policy. I don't know if you wanted to kind of sell that to the group or what I, your intent was. Yeah, I, I put I, you I, on the spot. A no, bit. no, I, I was totally going to ask for a second round. So that's because uh, I diverted us all on this question about inflation, and that was silly. Um, so yeah, no, that was actually my my last comment was around a resilience policy. I think there would be value there. There's a couple of things that to me could be baked into that. Um, um, among other things, we talked briefly about uh, seismic standards of buildings as something that we set some expectations about in UM buildings um, and and the standards. The other is um, you know we talked about today the localness of our um, of our energy generation. That might be a place where that gets reflected and then you know uh, reflected into the IRP as that continues on. I'm sure there are other things that might fit in there and and help you know just provide clarity about where the board wants to go but a couple of ideas there. I, I guess the only comment I, I, and I agree that those are those are good things. I guess my question to the staff would be how would you go about coming up with that policy? What I mean, how one, how much work is that going to be? Uh, and two, I mean that could be it could be as as narrow as we want all of all of our buildings to be life safety, you know, or it could be huge saying we want to have a, you know a hundred megawatts worth of power within 30 miles of here transmission direct I mean it could it's a it's a big pot and how do you how do you scope that I, I think that first of all we have to recognize this is a board level policy it's not an operational policy so it, sh it should provide guidance that leads us to be able to answer other sort of specific questions and so in these three areas so I'll, I'll Label them infrastructure, workforce, and finance. There's financial. There's there's probably certain things that we can use to to guide us going forward. And and let's take the seismic standard for example. I wouldn't call out a specific necessarily. I wouldn't propose that we call out a specific seismic standard. What I would propose is that the wording would be such that if we have critical assets that are necessary for the ongoing operation of the of the utility under seismic conditions that they would be designed and built to be able to serve the purpose that they're designed and built for from a seismic perspective. Now that if if we are building a a bathroom at Lieberg Park, that's going to have a different standard than if we're putting something next door here that's going to be critical to our operations. So we would we would want to structure this that provides the guidance necessary, but not necessarily calling out a specific so we'll we'll have to navigate that to be to be honest and we'll have to explore that a little bit um, in, in in how that balances out if, if, if that was your intent yeah exactly but we'll have to do a little catch ball back and forth between the board and staff on what this may look like and, and we'll see if we can land someplace productive there are definitely principles around that so I've got some ideas on that. And, and Rod's kind of within within his scope looking at at um, 
business continuity in general, for example, and resiliency is is a is a component of business continuity. So we'll have some further discussion. Wrapped up that item. Correspondence and board agenda. That's me too. Isn't it? <laughs> well, I skipped a board wrap up. Sorry. Oh, wait. <laughs> You're done. It's nine o'clock. <laughs> I'm done. I did. I did have both a flu shot and a COVID booster yesterday, so I was a little cranky. <laughs> this place a lot, Frank. This place a lot. It's probably too much information. Um, that will be shown in the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there were four pieces of correspondence. Uh, the integrated resource plan, um, a reminder that we have an upcoming conversation next month around the, the officer and liaisons, um, a wildfire review, and then the year in audit planning. Um, this, we start this time of year. Um, every year, and I didn't know if the board had any comments or questions for staff on that. And if if you don't, then I can uh, proceed into the board agenda report. Any questions on correspondence? Um, Matt? Yeah, just briefly, the draft IRP that's now public is super helpful. I think the way it's framed is is going to be great to help us have conversations with people about whether this meets interest of or the needs of you of customers. So thanks to the team for putting that together. Uh, I'm super eager to see the time frame for public outreach. Uh, in November. I know I emailed you this to extent, but you know, for the rest of the board, um, I think there would be a bunch of value in board members attending as many of those sessions as we can just to hear directly from folks what their, th their thoughts about the IRP as it is. Our, our thoughts are both participate in that way, but also um, providing the board with materials that you can speak to the subject as well um, on, on a number of these topics, whether it be um, Lieberg or Jason, Jason left, Jason's um, um, you know, comments about funding for a potential second source, um, IRP, to be able to have presentation materials, leave behinds, those types of things, we want we want to be able to supply that to the board, as well as um, use our online calendar. Um, in fact, you'll you'll notice we're starting to um, use the board agenda report to put public outreach events into that uh, report as well. So, um, you know, there there is. You know, a workshop coming up in February, for example, there'll be a lot of outreach. So it, I think this is this is important time uh, for all of us to be to be out there with the with the information, gauging you know truly genuinely listening to public feedback. So I just want to throw something out as far as the agendas go. I know that in the past we had a not so successful joint city of Eugene board uh, meeting. But I, I still think we should try to reach out to the city council and try and heal those wounds and 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 start to work collaboratively with the cities with the city council. Um, they've got a lot of things that interact with us. And I think it, it would behoove us to try and get that back on the agenda at some point in the spring or early summer next year, if, if possible. Um, again, the last one wasn't very productive and maybe there's a different format that it, it, it happens in. Um, but I, I think that that's something that's valuable and I would like to see us try to uh, to get it into an upcoming agenda. I know in the past we had a joint meeting with the Springfield utility and we haven't done that again. No, okay, so it's been a while <laughs> since we tried to do that. I don't know if there's a, a benefit there, if the you know, if we're still trying to work with them on the water source or not, but if we are, I think it would be valuable to that forward too. My other point was on the, the customer survey. I, I appreciate that, that it was provided in the almost thousand pages 
Um, but this is, I mean, these are our customers and I would like us to actually have some time to talk about this, you know, the survey, what came out of it. I mean, we had a report a number of years ago that I'd like to kind of look at the comparables, you know, where were we at, where have we come? I know some of that's in here, but it just, it, to me, it warrants a discussion on, you know, what we do with this information. I would like to see it come back so that we actually delve into it, see what does this mean? Because it has implications for, you know, other organizational goals and such. I know we adopted the, the goals there, but if there's other outcomes that come out of here that we're not doing well, or, you know, we could learn from, I'd like to have that be part of the discussion. Um, also, since our packet is 975 pages, or at least mine on my computer looks like it, um, it's hard to then dive into something like the customer survey. Like by that time, reading through the packet, I don't know, even though I put it off to later, it's just, it's really hard to digest that information. So I too would like, um, it'd be nice just maybe have a little presentation. It doesn't have to be a long thing, but just some. So just to clarify, there were, we did, I believe it was August, went through our customer survey that was our sort of general customer survey. Um, are you now our plan? Here. So maybe this is why oh, we, okay. I didn't get yeah. part of that so, in that way. So, okay. Our, our plan is to do a number of different types of outreach. That, that was a you know, residential only probably going to look at some other demographics specifically and we could incorporate some things into that. The specific sort of subject specific Lieberg survey was a much smaller group and part of that as well. I didn't know if you wanted to take extra time to look at that, but we did. And unfortunately, Commissioner Carlson, that was the meeting that you you weren't there. That is when we went through our our overall customer survey and talked about some of the deeper dives and some of the outcomes. I did, you know, we we can look uh, and see what's upcoming relative to different kinds of outreach. I know we are looking at doing some customer luncheons, for example, or, you know, with the with the um, commercial um, um, segment of, of our population. So, um, but I didn't, I did. I apparently just forgot, so it's straight that from the minutes or hopefully <laughs> not included. We, we confused you. That was with the seven, 977 pages of stuff. So. Um, and I have one more comment. Um, I appreciate that you're putting in the uh, public outreach as part of the upcoming board agendas and information. And I guess I just want to put it out there to my fellow commissioners. I represent everybody. <laughs> So if there are meetings that are part of your ward and you can't go to or um, want a buddy to go with you, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy to attend some of these meetings, but sometimes it's just hard for me to know because I know, you know, other people might be there, so. And then the other thing, I mean, Matt mentioned it earlier. The work session that we had where it was free flowing and we were talking about Lieber, was very helpful, and and I think it, it was something one of our better better things for me for gaining things. So if there's, I'm open to those types of things. I don't know how about the rest of the board, but but you know if there's issues that are more than a forty minute presentation, you know, twenty minutes from staff and twenty minutes from us, that that you feel would behoove us. Put a poll out there and see if that's something that we would want to do a special work session on because i think that those are oh. no sorry there's this howling noise that comes up oh okay i, I thought you were you were looking at my no. my idea and saying hey you i ain't coming for another meeting i looked over there and i was getting this stink eye. i was it's a belt ghost actually so oh, yeah. anyway, anyway so that that's just my my idea. There's some things that are that take more than than what we can do and and end up here at 9:15. I would I would be amenable to those. I'm in agreement with that. Record. <laughs> Tone my face. Show that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Any other 
Comments or correspondence and board agenda. Oh, the, only thing, the only thing I was going to mention is on board agendas. We we have started adding more of the community outreach. We're also going to make sure that those are on the, the eWeb calendar. There's an online calendar as well that we're starting to, to fill out. So um, and we're, we're trying to build in next year the potential for some of those work sessions, depending on where we are with comics. So. When you say eWeb calendar, is that on the website? Is that an interest? It's eweb.org slash calendar. Um, or you can just go to the main page and there's a calendar, um, I think, um, link on the first page. Right now, those show board meetings and a few other things, and we're going to just start filling those in with more of the community outreach type of work. These luncheons that you mentioned, you said that commissioners would be welcome to attend. Do we have to worry about forums at those type of thing? Potentially, we might, but we, we have enough time that we could provide notice. It's um, I, that's that's not a hurdle for us. Anything? I'm good. Okay. All, all done. Thank you. Okay, we will wrap up. We'll wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> nope, Frank. I just have one thing, and you know, this is I don't know where 2022 went really, um, but wanted to thank the board for all of your engagement really this this past year it's it has been quite a year there's been all kinds of interesting opportunities and decisions and things to contemplate and collaborate on and um you know as as karen said earlier relative to the Leeberg project your your engagement and your your care of uh, of the community is is really noteworthy and appreciated by staff so this is our last meeting of 20 you and just wanted to thank you for a good year. I think we got a lot accomplished, not everything that we wanted, but a lot of what we wanted and we'll look forward to coming back in 2023 and and getting more done next year. So I just want to thank you. I wanted to thank John Brown for uh, for his leadership this year and holding the fort and <laughs> sorry you thank couldn't you. be here. I know you're sad, but you're not. Uh, I'm, I'm heartbroken, but uh, you know, this is only, I've only physically missed one meeting in 16 years, so I'm, I think I'm okay to, at least the remote part is, makes it a lot easier, but it's hard to follow. It's much more difficult to track things when uh, you're on the Zoom than it is in person, so I highly prefer in-person meetings. Well, so thank you so much. Oh, thank you for the thank you. <laughs> All right, and I did want to make note that so in our next meeting, we'll be voting on, you know, board positions. So, just, you know, think about those and we have our discussion next month. We'll look at that. I, I'm on LCOG currently and I'm currently the vice chair, president, one of those. I'm the vice of some, but um, so if, somebody wanted to do that, they would step into that role. I'm more than happy to continue doing that and being in that role. Um, so I'll just throw that out there and also happy doing this role as well. So. Okay. If anybody else wants to make notes there? Oh, I'm just going to say uh, tomorrow night is the Mackenzie Watershed Council meeting. It's at the International Paper uh, Boardroom over in Springfield, five o'clock. I'm sure that now that we've had this little discussion tonight, there might be a, a few people that will want to talk to me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody else wants to come, you're more than, more than welcome, but I will report back in, in January as to what came out of that. Okay. Great. Well, thanks everyone for a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. We are adjourned. Quite an hour early, like John said. Good having not you. Know.